This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes yeah, yeah, yeah. transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Battle Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about an exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And so while you're getting comfortable, I'd like to tell you about an old, old American custom. The custom of serving a glass of sherry wine before dinner. Petri, California sherry. You know, Petri sherry is to a good meal what the overture is to a good musical comedy or an opera. Before you sit down at the dinner table, just pour yourself a little glass of Petri sherry and sip it slowly. Look at that beautiful amber color. Smell the fragrance of those sun-ripened grapes and taste that fine sherry flavor. You'll agree with me, I'm sure, that Petri sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. And say, if you happen to like your sherry dry, as I do, you'll really like Petri pale dry sherry. Believe me, you can't go wrong with any wine that bears the name Petri the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now let's drop in on the good Dr. Watson, who's waiting for us in his California ranch house. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Come in and make yourself a towel. Thank you, Doctor. Sitting here with the lights off, I see. You've been getting yourself in the mood for tonight's Sherlock Holmes story? No, my boy, I was watching the sunset. What a beautiful tonight. Right, doctor, the sun set over an hour ago. Yes, I know that, young fellow, my lad, I know that. At my age, a fellow entitled to take a little snooze after dinner, isn't he? Of course he is, doctor. And now that we've settled that, how about tonight's story? Well, a very beautiful girl figured prominently in this adventure. Her name was Jasmine Lafleur. Huh? Say that again, doctor, it, please. I know, my boy, but that was her stage name. When she was a magician's assistant. Unfortunately, I never had the opportunity of seeing Jasmine Lafleur in the theater. But I'm told that she was a fascinating figure in tights, bangles. <laughs> when Holmes and I first met her, however, she was uh, dressed a little more conventionally. And her name was then Diana Venery. Lady Venery. Lady Venery? Say, those tights and spangles really paid off, didn't they? Well, how did you and Sherlock Holmes come to meet up with the doctor? In rather spectacular style, Mr. Miss Lafleur became something of a femme fatale in the early 1900s. First of all, she married Signor Rossoni, a magician for whom she was working. On the wedding night, he was mysteriously stabbed to death. A few months later, Madame Rossoni, very fetching in her widow's weeds, I'm sure, met Sir Wilfrid Venery, and, after a whirlwind courtship, married him. Don't tell me he got murdered, too. He did also on the night of the wedding. At this time, the police found a suspect. It was a certain Major Beckworth, cousin of the dead man, and an ardent suitor of the fair Diana. The trial at the Old Bailey was one of the most sensational I ever remember. Sherlock Holmes and I, in, in court on the closing day as a jury, were still considering their verdict. Holmes, the, the jury's been out over eight hours. I bet you they can't agree on a verdict and there'll be a new trial. I think not, old chap. Look, here they come now. now. There's a strong moral probability of guilt, but I'm sure they'll agree that there's insufficient evidence to convict. Oh, perhaps you're right. Just look at Lady Venering down there ahead of us. What a, what a stunning woman. Yes, a woman of great poise and courage. Here it comes. Gentlemen of the jury, have you arrived at a verdict? Yes, my lord. How say you? Do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? No. Guilty. Exactly. Come on, Watson. Let's get a breath of fresh air. Well, I was wondering perhaps if we shouldn't go over and congratulate Lady Venery. On what? The fact that her husband's murderer has not been found? Oh, I suppose you're right. Have you ever read the book of Turbid, Watson? Turbid? I don't think so. When was it published? Well, a little before our time, old chap. It's an Old Testament story. <laughs> Whatever made you think of it at <laughs> this moment? Well, it's so remarkably... Apposite for the case Lady Perry deals with a highly peculiar series of murders, seven of them, if I remember correctly. It was a murderer. A jealous demon by the name of Asmodeus who strangled husbands on their wedding nights. 
Well, judging by the verdict just now, Mr. Beckworth isn't the asthma deer, so whatever you call him in this case. <laughs> Here, no, boy, here. Give me a paper. Thank you, Captain. Thank you. Paper! Paper! Well, Holmes, what's it say? Here, mate. Here we are. Listen to this. <laughs> Lady Venering, widow of the murdered man, says that she will marry the suspect. Lady Venering told newspaper reporters this afternoon that if Major Beckwith is acquitted, she will marry him before the year is out. Oh, my soul, Holmes, there's a positive sparkle in your eyes. You read about her. I must admit the lady fascinates me, old chap. I hope before she becomes involved in any further tragedies that we may have the opportunity of meeting her. And something tells me that we will. Uh, some of the papers are certainly having a field day over the bettering case, Holmes. <laughs> Did you read them? There's a complete life history of Lady Venering in one of them with photographs. It's uh, rather interesting. Really? What are you doing over there, Holmes? Looking out of the window. Ah, uh, yes. Are you expecting anybody home? No, come over here, old fellow. Well, Good. Very agitated one. Look at the way he's pacing up and down. And looking up at our window, too. Yo, what eyes? Yes, with a fanatical look about him which suggests either the martyr at the stake or the inquisitor lighting the faggots. Mr. Carson's letting him in now. Well, I'd be interested to know what he's come to us about. Your footsteps on the stairs. I'll, I'll go and have a look. I am, sir, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. My name is Whalen, the Reverend Arthur Whalen. How do you do, sir? Down to you and uh, tell me what I can do for you. Thank you. Mr. Holmes, this, this is a very difficult subject to approach. In fact, it's only after intense personal conflict that I've been able to force myself to come. May I ask you, are you familiar with the history? Talking about that yesterday, Holmes. I see that you've come to consult me about the Venering case. Please. How did you know? Has Lady Venner been in touch with you? Uh, no, sir, but uh, I'm familiar with the book of Toby. Venom's case closely resembles that of the woman Sarah of the Old Testament story. More closely than you realize, Mr. Holmes. Did you know that each one of Lady Venering's husband was killed? They received a threatening note? Yes, I recall that from the file. Signed in some sort of gibberish, weren't they? No, Doctor. Yesterday I was permitted for the first time to examine one of these books. The apparent gibberish was in reality ancient Hebrew writing. Indeed. Are you able to translate it? Yes, Mr. Holmes. In effect, it said... If you go through with this marriage, your hours are numbered. And it was signed as no days. Name of the jealous demon who strangled husbands in the book of Tobit. Exactly. Just why have you come to me, sir? I want you to talk to Diana, uh, to Lady Bannering, to tell her she must not go through with this new marriage. No is stalking her, Mr. Holmes. I have argued with her, prayed with her, implored her to realize her danger. But she is adamant. I'm afraid I should feel extremely presumptuous in giving her my advice. No, Mr. Holmes. I have prepared the way for you. You could, I'm sure, and I realize her danger. And she's willing to see me, you say? Willing and anxious. Oh, very well. But I'd like to ask you a few questions first. Anything, Mr. Holmes. What is your interest in her? She is, she's a member of my club. She needs her guidance. Nothing further? Mr. Holmes? Well, I believe that you uh, performed the date ceremony at both of her previous weddings. Yes. Are you proposing to officiate the uh, ceremony if she marries Major Beckwith? I don't know. I'm hoping that marriage will never take place. And so I want you to help me, Mr. Holmes. Where does the lady live? 47, Barclay Square. Very well. Uh, Dr. Watson and I will call on her this afternoon. Yes, delighted to. Delighted. I doubt if I can be there myself. In fact, Diana might speak more freely if I'm not. But uh, here's my, my card. Oh, You'll you know where to get in touch with me if you want to. Very well, sir. Good day to you, gentlemen. I am greatly in your debt. Good day. Good day. Hey, Mrs. Holmes, I don't believe that Mr. Whalen's motives are entirely impersonal. Nor can I, old chap. <laughs> hmm? Who are I was thinking of the book of Tobit once. Huh? In that, the role of protector, the role I had just been asked to take, uh, was played by the Archangel Raphael. 
can't help feeling once that I'm making distinct strides in my profession. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I'm so glad to meet you. How do you do, Lady Venering? May I introduce my old friend, Dr. Watson? How are you, Dr. Watson? Glad to meet you, Lady Venering. <laughs> Uh, let's sit down, shall we? You're just in time for tea. Oh, thank you. Um, you know why we're here, of course. Oh, naturally. Mr. Whalen came round here as soon as he'd left you. Uh, you were to persuade me to look after my mortal affairs, uh, while he takes care of my own And that is... Uh, may I say, Mr. Holmes, that I'm flattered that a man of your eminence should be sufficiently interested to bother about You underestimate your own importance, Lady Venering. Though I may mention that if your problem had been as simple as Mr. Whaler made it out to be, I might have been otherwise engaged. For being very frank and a little mysterious. Are you suggesting that Mr. Whalen didn't tell you everything? I am. And I hope you will be more candid. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, I like you. You're most refreshing. Uh, milk and sugar in your tea? Uh, just milk, thank you. Here you are. How about you, Dr. Watson? Oh, the same way, please. Thank you, my dear. And now, Mr. Holmes, perhaps you'll tell me why you think that you haven't been told everything. Before I answer that, uh, Lady Venering, I wonder if I might ask you some questions. But of course. Anything. When your first husband, uh, Signor Rossoni, was killed, did the police find any suspects? Uh, yes, one. Ferdinand Gautier, a young man who had been an assistant in our magician's act. Uh... Stupid, good thing boy who thought he was in love with me. But of course, Inspector Lestrade had to release him. There was no evidence. Inspector Lestrade, you can bet that if he arrested him, <laughs> the boy was innocent. A warning note was found among your husband's effects, wasn't it? Yes. And it was signed in Hebrew with the name Asmodeus. Uh, but perhaps you're not familiar with the Book of Tobias. Oh, yes, yes, sir. I am. I'm familiar with it, Lady Venering. Uh, how did you know then that the Hebrew letter signified that name? Mr. Whalen translated them for me. Oh, I see. And also read me the book of Tobit. Uh, he's always been particularly fond of that book. Perhaps because it illustrates his own ideas on the dangers of marriage. But Holmes told us that he hadn't seen one of the warning notes until yesterday. Precisely. Lady Venering, I read in the papers that you intend to marry Major Beckwith, the man who has just been tried for your late husband's murder. Yes, Mr. Holmes. When are you going to marry him, may I ask? When it pleases me. Don't you prefer to be with her? Also, that Major Beckwith's life is in obvious danger. Of course, it occurs to be, my dear man. But because of two tragic marriages, am I to spend the rest of my life alone, as Mr. Whalen would have me do? I'm young, alive. Peter, what are you doing here? I just arrived back in England today, Diana. What's this I read about you marrying Beckwith? Peter, I have guests. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. This is Pima Combs. One of our most promising young painters. Diana, true. tell me it isn't true. When I left England, you left. And I, you. I come back and what do I find? You're planning to marry Beckwith. Well, I won't stand for it. You think you can throw me over like some silly boy. You're very much mistaken. I can tell things, you know. I can tell lots of things. Get out of here, Peter. Get out. Diana. And don't come back until you've learned manners and discretion. But, but Diana. Get out. Were there any more questions you wanted to ask me, Mr. Holmes? Uh, one, Lady Venering. Uh, where is your fiancé, Major Beckwith? He's upstairs. Uh, I'm letting him stay here until the scandal is over. Yeah, I, I must see him at once. Once? Why, Holmes? No danger until the marriage takes place? The marriage has taken place, Watson, unless what? I'm very much mistaken. It makes you think so, Mr. Holmes. You're much too discreet and intelligent, Lady Venering, to let him stay here in your house unless you were already married. <laughs> We were married this morning. But we planned to keep the fact a secret for a few months until the scandal had died down. May I talk to him, please? Of course. I'll ring for the butler and ask him to come. May I ask, uh, madam, who married you? Reverend Arthur. Oh, all the time he talked to us today, he knew perfectly well that this marriage had taken place. He must have just come from it. I don't trust that man, Holmes. Oh, there you are, my friend. Uh, will you ask me to bed? Excuse me, you lady. I'm just on my way to telephone the police. Police? What do you mean? It's Major Beckwith, you know. He's been stabbed to death in his blood. Beckwith? 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 Beckwith?
was murdered, too. Hutchison, I'll telephone the police. I know I'm rather well acquainted with this place. Third husband murdered on his wedding day. What a woman, what superb magnificence. What on earth do you mean, Holmes? What courage. Who could have spirit in the face of a fresh tragedy? What such a fascinating I haven't seen such a splendid female since we solved that case for the Bohemia. <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. Time enough to remind you that the easiest way to make good food taste better is to serve that good food with a swell Petri wine. And there are two Petri wines in particular just made to go with food. Petri California Sauterne, a delicate white wine with a subtle flavor that's perfect with chicken and fish. And Petri California Burgundy, a hearty, rich red wine that's out of this world with any meat or meat dish. So if you want to know just how good a cook you are, serve your good food with Petri wine made to go with it. A Petri Burgundy or a Petri Sauterne. Two swell Petri mealtime wines. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The famous detective and his old friend Dr. Watson have become involved in the affairs of thrice married Diana, one time magician's assistant. Each of her husbands has been mysteriously murdered on his wedding day. The latest murder occurring the same day that Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are brought into the case. As we rejoin our story, it's a month later, and for some obscure reason, Sherlock Holmes seems to have lost interest in the case, though not in it. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mr. Dodd? It's over a month now since Major Beckwith was murdered, and we haven't found a single clue to it. You expect me to supply the deficiencies of Scotland Yard? Well, it's unlikely you not to help us, Mr. Holmes. After all, you and Dr. Watson were in the house when it happened. If you ask me, the murderer is either McComas, that Irish painter, or the clergyman Wayne. Now, what do you think, sir? As far as I'm concerned, the case is closed, Mr. Arden. I wish you'd stop bothering me. What do you think I am? Nothing but a detecting machine? Mr. Holmes, whatever's come over you. Holmes, you're not going out again this evening, are you? I'm afraid so, old chap. Well, this will be the fourth night in a row. I was hoping that we might have a nice quiet evening. Oh, I'm sorry, Watson, but I promised to take Diana to the horse show at Olympia. I shall be home by midnight. Mr. Holmes, yes, Mr. Whalen. You are seeing altogether too much of Diana. She seems to be completely under your spell. But you introduced me to her in the first place with a request that I keep an eye on her. I made a great mistake. As her spiritual protector, I'm afraid I must ask you to stop seeing her. I'm afraid I must ask you, sir, to mind your own business. <laughs> seen the paper that that violinist, his diary, is playing at the Albert Hall tonight? Uh, no, I haven't looked at the paper today. Oh, I we might go along and see Oh, I'm together. afraid I can't hold you up. No, I'm taking Diana to the French maid at Daly's Theatre. I hear it's a, a charming musical comedy. Look here, Holmes. We've been friends for so many years now. Very true, old fellow. And I think I'm entitled to speak to you straight from the shoulder. Of course you are, Watson. Very well, then. This... Diana Beckwith. Oh. I can't bear to see her making such a fool of you. You neglected your work entirely since you met her. You get about as a young fellow of 20. What's come over you? Stop, stop facing the about her, Chapman, and sit down. In fact, uh, it might be a good idea if you caught hide yourself with a little brandy from the counter there. Uh, what I'm about to tell you, uh, maybe something of a shock. Um, what's in uh, uh, Diana. And I are getting married tomorrow. Uh, I'm getting married tomorrow. But, uh, you're insane. Oh, that's not very flattering, Watson. Anyway, I don't see why you should be so surprised. You, you, you yourself married and left Baker Street once, didn't you? You, Holmes, a confirmed woman. Oh, no, 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 my dear Watson. No, indeed, no. You will remember in our adventure that you titled A Scandal in Bohemia, I met a lady that I have often referred to as a Christian. Woman. You mean Irene Adler, but she was a criminal. Exactly, and yet Diana has the same magnificent characteristics. Keen intelligence, courage, and unconquerable spirit. At home, three of her husbands murdered on their wedding nights. You're proposing to be the fourth. Oh, rubbish, my dear fellow, because tragedy has attended her previous marriages. Is she to go through life alone? Oh, 
Of course I do. I think I will have a nip of brandy. Oh, don't take it so bad, old fellow. We'll continue to see a lot of each other. Diana's very fond of you, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can call me Sarah. Not the, the Reverend Mr. Whaler. Oh, no, no, no. no. He decided, in view of Diana's previous marriages, that he might prove to be a trifle, uh, well, unlucky. A clergyman named Bernay will officiate. Whalen, of course, insists on being present just the same. Mm, what time is the wedding tomorrow? Two o'clock, old fellow. Oh, uh, I should have mentioned this before. I hope your cutaway coat and top hat are in a good state preservation. You'll be a pretty prominent figure at the ceremony, you know. You mean that, uh, that... Well, I mean that uh, if Sherlock Holmes gets married, who else could be his best man but his old friend, Dr. Watson? It's elementary, my dear fellow, elementary. <laughs> I now pronounce men and wife, and those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Diana, I'm going to claim the privilege of the best man and <laughs> give you a kiss. Of course you shall, Doctor. It's you, Holmes, you... Lucky fuller. Of course I am, old chap. Uh, Sherlock, I'm going upstairs to change my dress now. Very well, Diana. I'll be up shortly. I'll see you later, Dr. Watson. Very well, Mrs. Holmes. <laughs> you know, I thought I'd live to say that. Uh, what's no fellow? I'm worried. Worried? Oh, dear fellow, what's the matter? Well, just before the ceremony, I received one of those warning notes signed by Asmodeus. Oh, you better be careful, Holmes. I think I'll slip out and have a pipe or two on the matter. Yes. Look after my guests, Father William. and... I will indeed. Oh, there you are, Mr. Weldon. Would you care for a glass of champagne or a punch or something or other? Thank you, no, Doctor. I'm in no mood for celebration. I'm certain that Diana has made a shocking mistake. Well, really, sir, I don't think... I you... only came here in a last-minute attempt to dissuade her. Now that I've failed, I shall leave. Good day, sir. Oh. Watson. Oh, hello, McDermott. Where's Mr. Holmes? We'll be back in a few minutes. Would you care for a glass of champagne, sir? Thank you. I should like to drink a toast to the pair. I've been in love with Diana for years, you know, but she wouldn't marry me, and... Well, I suppose I might as well make the best of it. I, I must say, your friend Sherlock Holmes seems like a splendid fellow. He is indeed, McCormick. In fact, I may say... Watson. Excuse me, sir. All right, Holmes, I'm coming. Up here. What is the matter, Holmes? Follow me, lock the door behind you. Allow me to introduce you to the demon Asmodeus, Watson. Unfortunately, at the moment, she's in a faint. It's Diana. Exactly. Always an impetuous woman, she made the mistake of trying to stab me with that knife. So I bent over to strap up a suitcase. She didn't allow for the wall mirror in which I was watching her. You mean you suspected her all along? Of course I did, old fellow. Probably was to find the proof. I first suspected her when I knew that she'd been a magician's assistant. The key to the profession of magic is misdirection. And these murders have been a perfect example of misdirection motive. How do you mean, Holmes? Well, by creating as it is, thanks to the well-meaning stories of uh, the Reverend Mr. Whalen, whose theological libraries, she must have copied the Hebrew signature. She focused the murders on jealousy, concealing the fact that the one person with a perfect motive was herself, the widow who was to inherit. Oh, why hasn't she been caught before? Because she was cle devilishly clever left no clues except an indirect one that I had once spotted, that the likeliest person to be able to approach a bridegroom unsuspected and stab him is his bride. And now I wish you'd see if you can revive her, old fellow. When the police get here, I should like Mrs. Holmes to be in full possession of all her faculties. <laughs> I must say, I never expected to be driving back with you to Baker Street on your wedding day. <laughs> I can't tell you how happy I feel. Dear old Watson, you really thought that I deserted you, didn't you? Oh, naturally, I wish you'd tell me the truth. Why couldn't tell anyone? Not even you. If the faintest shadow of suspicion had entered our mind, I'd never have caught her. Well, it seems to me you paid a pay high price, Holmes. You told me you made a will in her favor. Supposing something happened to you before her trial, she'd get the money, you know? Oh, the will? Oh, no, that was worthless. I told Diana... But it was a holographic will and perfectly valid. Well, what on earth is a holographic will? Uh, a will drawn up in uh, one's own handwriting on a piece of perfectly plain paper. 
Such a document is quite legal, but I drew mine up on a paper with, uh, well, with a letterhead. That made it um, invalid. I see, but the fact remains that you are married, Holmes. <laughs> I, I really fooled you completely, didn't I, Watson? Uh, didn't the name of the clergyman who married us suggest anything to you? The Reverend Vernet, no, and why not should it? Well, Vernet was a French painter of some note. He also happens to have been a great uncle of mine and um, you, Mycroft's. You mean that, that your brother Mycroft was a clergyman? I mean that Mycroft was disguised as a clergyman. And a very convincing job he did too. A more satisfactory clergyman than the Reverend Mr. Whalen, no doubt, whose possible complicity may compel him to answer some very awkward questions. Then you're not married. Well, upon my soul, Holmes, I, I don't know what to say. Then I suggest that you say nothing, my dear chap. Let's just sit back quietly, as two good friends can, and brood about the uh, mutability of human affairs. <laughs> Well, Doctor, tonight's adventure was really a little extraordinary, to say the least. Holmes sure had a narrow escape. Uh, doubly narrow, Mr. Foreman, doubly narrow. He not only escaped the, the jaws of death, but he also escaped the, the clutches of matrimony. Actually, the story had a happy ending for everybody but Lady Venering. Uh, uh, Jasmine Lafleur. What about that artist fellow, McComas? How did he take it? Oh, very well, very well indeed. In fact, in gratitude, he even painted Holmes's portrait. Not exactly a good likeness, though. One of those modern artist to paint his impressions of a person rather than a portrait. What do you mean? Well, now, let me see. If he were to paint his impression of you, you'd probably end up by looking like a bottle of Petri wine in a sports jacket. Go ahead, Doctor. You can tease me all you want, but I'll still rave about Petri wine. And why not? The facts bear me out that Petri wine most certainly is good wine. After all, the Petri family knows all there is to know about the art of turning plump, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. That's because they've been making wine for generations, ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, the family has been able to hand down from father to son, from father to son, all their skill and knowledge and experience. And believe me, that adds up to plenty. So no matter what type of wine you prefer, one to serve with meals or a wine for any special occasion, choose one of the fine Petri wines. You can't miss, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watton, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, let me see, Mr. Foreman. I'm going to tell you about, uh, about a strange adventure that began by my taking a wild cab ride through the moonlit streets of London and ended Holmes and me being trapped in a luxuriously furnished cellar below a furniture warehouse down by the waterfront. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Shoscombe Old Place. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri. This is Bill Foreman saying good night for the Petrie family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes.
The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with that master detective, his old friend Sherlock Holmes. And say, I want to tell you about a little present I've got for you. Uh-huh, a present and it's free. It's a swell recipe calendar printed in full color and it's good for two years, 1945 and 46. But best of all, this calendar not only gives you the dates, it gives you loads of swell recipes and ideas for cooking with Petri wine. Want to know how to make spare ribs that are out of this world? You want to learn a new way to fix liver and onions, a swell way to make soup more delicious than ever. It's a cinch with this calendar handy in your kitchen to tell you how. In fact, this calendar tells you all you ought to know about wine. And remember, it's free. Just write to Petri Wine. P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco, 26, California. Petri Wine, San Francisco, 26, California. We'll send you your swell recipe calendar immediately. And now for our weekly visit with the genial Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Come in and... Oh, thank you. You're looking particularly comfortable tonight, Doctor. Feet up on the sofa and the puppies asleep on your lap. Yes, my boy. The three of us went for a long walk on the feet this afternoon. Monty and Winnie had a running battle with the seagull. In consequence, they've been fast asleep ever since we got home. Oh, I hope you're not too tired, Doctor. I'm counting on a new Sherlock Holmes story, you know. No, no, no. I'm all ready for you, Mr. Foreman. In fact, I was going through my notes on the case... Right. Well, last week you told us it concerned a strange society who held their meetings in an underground vault of a furniture warehouse. Yeah, that's right, my boy. Now, down, Winnie. Now, you down, Monty. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. The story really began one stormy November night in 1887. I was married at the time and living away from Baker Street. On this night in question, my wife had already gone to bed and I was nodding in front of the fire over one of Clark Russell's fine sea stories. I'd had a very tiring day, I remember. It was about the hour that a man gives his first yawn and glances to the clock. When suddenly, a front doorbell jangled his uh, Our servant Edna had gone up to bed, so I crossed to the window and opened it. It was uh, very dark, but I could just see the outline of a figure standing on my doorstep. It looked like a woman. Suddenly, a, a cultivated voice called up to me. Is the doctor in? Uh, yes, madam. Uh, I'm the doctor. Please come at once. It's a matter of life and death. I have a carriage waiting. Uh, all right, all right. I'll, I'll be down immediately. I closed the window, scribbled a note to my wife, grabbed my coat and hat and my bag. And a few minutes later, I stepped out of the front door and closed it behind me. A carriage was standing at the curb. But I couldn't see any trace of the lady who called me. The only person in sight was an old and repulsive looking bigger woman, dressed in rags and tatters. After a moment of bewilderment, I spoke. Uh, my, my good woman, did you see a lady leave here a moment ago? No, Doctor, she didn't leave. She's still waiting for you. Oh, oh forgive me, madam, but uh, <laughs> those clothes are yours. Uh, I thought you were a beggar woman. There isn't any time to discuss that now. Please get in this carriage. Mm -hmm. but, uh, where, where's the driver? I'm going to drive. Please get in. Very well, very well. It's the only business. Uh, are you sure that you can handle those horses, madam? Of course I can. Well, I wish you'd tell me the way you're, you're driving, ma'am. Please don't ask me any more questions, Doctor. You'll find out soon enough. We finally reached our destination. Must have driven halfway across London. Oh, hello, hello. Must be somewhere down near the river. No dwelling places here. Nothing but enormous warehouse. Uh, why have we stopped here, madam? Please stop me down these steps. I wish you'd tell me where you're taking me. We have a, a club here in the basement. See for yourself. Mm. 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 
very solid looking door. How do you propose to get past it? I'd show you. Club of yours, madam? It is, Doctor. Oh, Knox. Number seven. Leave the password. The lanterns. You may enter. Follow me, Doctor. I do wish you'd tell me where you're taking me. This looks like the entrance to an opium den or a thieves' kitchen. Don't worry, Doctor. You're in no danger. There. Does that look like a thieves' kitchen? Great Scott, I don't believe my eyes. A luxuriously furnished room. What a strange collection of people. Some look like beggars, others in full evening dress. Amazing. Uh, number seven. Who is this man? He's a doctor. I went to fetch you. I thought I said there would be no strangers inside Now, look here, here, my good man. I've been extremely patient, but my temper's beginning to wear a little thin. Either let me see your patient at once, or show me out. My time's valuable, and I don't propose to waste it. I'm sorry, doctor. Where is Julian? He's in the back room. And if you know what's good for you, doctor, whatever you call yourself, you'll forget everything you see in here. Stop threatening me, sir. I'm not in the least interested in your blasted club. Just take me to the patient. This is the man we want you to examine, Doctor. Huh? What happened? He fell down the stairs, leading into the club room. Well, why'd you move him? We wanted him to be comfortable. The worst thing in the world you could have done. Never, never move a person with an injured skull. It is. Is it going to be all right, Doctor? Well, madam, I'm easy. Next broke. He's dead. Huh? I am dead. Sure of that, Doctor? Of course, I'm sure of it, my good man. I'm afraid you need an undertaker, not a doctor. Tell the others. All right, quiet, everybody. Quiet. Quiet. Julian is dead. Julian? Julian dead? Oh, this is terrible. Who is this man? He's a doctor. We better get him out of here at once. We don't want any strangers nosing about. That's right, though. Shouldn't have brought him here anyway. Now, just a minute, just a minute. I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, I haven't the slightest desire to stay here one moment longer. You direct me to the door again, madam. I'll try to find a cab myself in this godforsaken district and go home. Show him out and give him his money. Follow me, I'm delighted. Do you mind if I don't drive you home, Doctor? Oh, no, I prefer it. My nerves aren't in the best of shape. You mustn't be angry with me, Doctor, please. Leaving again, number seven. No, but this gentleman is. Will you see if you can find a cab for him? Right. To whom shall I send in my bill, madam? Here's a five-pound note. That should cover your time and trouble, shouldn't it? No, no, no. no. It's, it's far too much, madam. No, Doctor. It's late at night, and it hasn't been a very pleasant case for you. Please take it. Mm. Kind of. We're very jealous indeed. But by the way, uh, uh, how did you happen to, to come to me in the first place? I was driving about looking for a doctor, and a policeman directed me to your house. Oh, I see. found a cab twice. Well, thank you, my man. Thank you. Oh, Doctor, may I come round in the morning? For a death certificate. Of course, because you remember my address? Yes, but I don't know your name. Uh, Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson. Watson? Not, not the Dr. Watson who's associated with Sherlock Holmes. Oh, madam, I'm that is that you know of me. Good night, Doctor. And please forget about everything you've seen. interested to hear about this. And that's the way it was, Holmes. One of the most curious adventures I ever had without you. Very interesting, Watson. You say this underground cellar was luxuriously mm. furnished. Yes, and the people there were an amazing mixture. Some were in rags and some in evening dress. Huh, like the mystery rhyme, eh? Some in rags and some in tags and some in velvet gowns. Oh, exactly. 
came with a feeling that I was taking part in a story out of the Arabian Nights. I must say, though, I was pretty angry at the time. However, after a good night's rest, I, I feel quite different to this morning. But I thought I'd just drop round and tell you all about it. Glad you did, my dear fellow. It would be interesting to see if any repercussion of your strange adventure reaches. Oh, I doubt it. The woman seemed quite in the death when I mentioned your name. We shall see. Meanwhile, I'm expecting a plan. If you're not too busy, perhaps you can stay. No, I'd like you very much. Uh, who is it, you know? This telegram will tell you much more than I can. Arrived an hour ago. Mm, let's have a look. Be at your lodging this morning to discuss our problem. Signed, AMS. <laughs> a high-handed message. Be at your lodging. So please, <laughs> suppose AMS then. I was just trying with that problem when you arrived. Could it be the uh, American medical? No, no, there's no such body. The American Medical Association. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The curious yes, yes. uh, tone of the message inclines me to believe that the A stands for amateur. Very possibly. Amateur Masker Society. Or uh, the amateur murderers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would be a nice thought, wouldn't it? Mm. Uh, that is their representative now, no doubt. Save us further guesswork. Holmes, it looks like the same carriage that I drove in last night. The girl standing on your doorstep is a hyperfetch. The turning her in. Splendid. It seems that we have not heard the end of your adventure. Go and meet the lady at the top of the stairs, will you? Well, chap and save Mrs. Hudson's legs. Right, go home. Your service, madam. Won't you, uh, I'm Lady Dorothy Brownlee. It's your voice. You're the lady who fetched me last night, uh, dressed up as, as a beggar woman. Yes, I am, Dr. Watson. Forgive me for being so mysterious at the time. Doubtless you have come to consult me regarding last night's unfortunate accident at the Amateur Mendicant Society. Did you know what the initials stood for, Mr. Holmes? Well, after hearing Dr. Watson's story of last night's happening, the uh, connotations seemed obvious. Am I right? Perfectly. Last night, when Dr. Watson told us Julian was dead, we thought it was an accident. And now you think it was a uh, murder, eh? Lady Bramley, if you expect my help, there must be no more mystery. Just what is this amateur mendicant society? I'm afraid it'll be a little hard for you to understand our motives. We're a group of people, rather wealthy people, I suppose, who find pleasure in deliberately leading a seamy life disguised as beggars. We used the basement of Julian last night, Doctor, as our headquarters. Keep our beggars clothes there and change out of them before we go home. Mm, what a fantastic idea. But you are a worthless way of spending your leisure time, Lady Brownlee. I suppose <laughs> it must seem so. But we're curious to learn how the other half lives. And of course, there's a certain thrill in rubbing shoulders with the police. At least they do some good. Indeed. I should be interested to learn how. All well, the money we make as beggars, we give to charity. What do you really? And you feel that this gesture on your part absolves you from any responsibility to the real beggars whose livelihood you're impairing. Hadn't thought of it just like that. Then I suppose you won't want to have it. Oh, that's right. I'm a professional detective. I've done a detective. Moralist, yes, I will investigate this case for you, though I warn you my fee will be an extremely high one. Money isn't important, Mr. Holmes, as long as we can solve Julian's death without bringing the police into the case. Lady Brownlee. Who is the dead man? The man you refer to as Julian. Julian Trevor, the poet. He was the one who started out with the man. Red top of his word. Decker. Distinctly Decker. What makes you think that he was murdered, Lady Brownham? Last you left last night, Dr. Watson. It was a terrible scene. You remember Sidney Holt? Uh, he's the big fellow who was so unpleasant to him? Yes, that's the one. Oh, do I remember him? <laughs> he said that he saw Lord Cecil deliberately tripped him as he came to the head of the staircase. Oh, Lord Cecil being, uh... Lord Cecil Theron, son of the Earl of Bishop. There was a bitter argument. Cecil accused Sidney of doing the same thing. Then they had a dreadful fight. It ended up with Bethel threatening to go to the police. That thing is going to send a telegram to you. So the proof of murder depends on such flimsy evidence as whether the dead man fell or, well, was pushed. It seems like... Mr. Holmes... Even though you don't approve, please help us, won't you? Yes, Lady Brownlee, I will. Then you come back with me now to our headquarters. I shall join you within the hour. In the meantime, my old friend Dr. Watson will go with you. Oh, 
I do without you. You know my methods, old chap. Act accordingly. Oh, very well, Mr. Holmes. But you promise you'll be there. I promise you that I will be there, madam. Thank you so much, Mr. Holmes. We'll be expecting you. Come on, Bob. Well, I'll, I'll just get my hat and coat. Holmes, what are you up to? Go with her and ask no more questions. I shall join you within the hour. Oh, there's a glint in your eye. I don't think you can believe me, Tom. Of course I don't, Watson. Well, then what? Then go with it, old fellow, and keep your wits about you. Game's afoot. The story of the Amateur Mendicant Society will continue in just a few seconds. Time I'd like to use to remind you that you're really missing something until you try having wine with your dinner. And I mean a Petri wine. Let's say a Petri California Burgundy or a Petri California Sauternes. Both wines are just made to make good food taste better. If you like a red wine, try Petri Burgundy. Try it with hamburger, with stew, with any meat or meat dish. And if you like a delicious white wine, a wine that'll make chicken taste better than ever, try a well-chilled Petri Sauternes. With food, nothing can take the place of a good Petri wine. <laughs> And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The Amateur Mendicant Society, a group of wealthy eccentrics who pose as beggars, have come to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson with a problem. One of their members has apparently been murdered, and the famous pair have been asked to investigate the killing. As we rejoin our story, Dr. Watson, still awaiting the arrival of the great detective, is cross-questioning three of the members at the headquarters of this... But I don't find your story very convincing. Oh, uh, don't you now? Then suppose you stop asking questions until Sherlock Holmes gets here. He's the man we've engaged to settle this business, not you. We're paying for his services, not those of his assistant. Uh, Mr. Holmes asked me to conduct this preliminary investigation, my good man. I'm perfectly familiar with his methods, so keep a civil tongue in your head if you want us to continue with this case. Well, I'm not answering any more questions till he gets here. Dr. Fuller, uh, Lord Cecil... You say that you saw Holt deliberately trip the dead man as he came down the stairs last night? Yes, I did. Well, uh, where were you standing, sir? At the head of the staircase. Holt was beside me, and as Julian came by, he deliberately... Excuse me, please. Excuse me, number 11. Excuse uh, me. What is it? There is a strange man just come in. He is dressed as you when you work, but I do not remember to have seen him here before. He speaks very rough. Did he give the correct signal? Yes, and the password. He must be a new member. Well, I suppose we'd better see him. Bring him in. A bad time for him to come. Straight, please. Tommy. Nice face you've got here. Yeah, quite a nice face. Just you do yourselves proud, don't you? Who are you, and how did you get in here? I'll give you a signal and a password, just like Julian told me to. Are you a friend of Julian? Of course I am. You got me to meet him here today. Who are you, really? Are we all friends here? Yes, you can talk freely. Permit me to introduce myself. I am John Louis Jose Fernando de la Solis at your study. Why? Why do you want to join us? When Julian tell me about this, uh, well, it's a uh, tickle my how you say, uh, my funny bone. <laughs> it is a so charming idea. I think you're not those of mendicancy. I suppose he's all right, but of course I'm all right. Now, where is Julian, please? He will uh, vouch for me. He's in the other room. He had an accident. An accident? Not a bad one, I hope. A oh, very bad one. Dr. Watson, you better take him in there and break the news to him. Uh, very well, uh, follow me. This is terrible. Please tell me what happened, Doctor. I'm afraid you must prepare yourself for a shock, sir. Your friend is dead. Hey. His neck was broken last night. Oh. Holmes! But not quietly enough, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Come on, come back to the others and let all take a look at you. Come on, get moving, both of you. This isn't a pop gun in my hands. Sorry, Holmes, I gave the whole thing away. That's all right, old chap. Oh, Cecil, Dorothy, come here. I want you to take a look at the great Sherlock Holmes. Walked into our trap just like any stupid policeman. I had to dress up to do it, though, Mr. Holmes. We were waiting for you here anyway, you know. Oh, I was well aware of that, Mr. Holt. You see, I knew I was walking into a trap. How did you know that, Mr. Holt? Lady Barney, the story you brought to us today was obviously a false one. Just as there is no amateur mendicant to sign. Who are they, Holmes? Go ahead, Mr. Holmes. Tell him. Let's see how much you really do now. 
Christ, I tell you what you already know. Go on, talk, if you know what's good for you. And you're so persuasive, aren't you, Mr. Cole? Very well. Undoubtedly, Julian Trevor's death last night was an accident. You affected the doctor, Lady Brownlee, a very natural move, and later discovered that the doctor in question was the old friend of Sherlock Holmes. You were all afraid that I would become interested in your unusual society, and so you invented that very thin story about the accident being a murder. You wanted to lure me here so that I could be disposed of, and you could all continue your nefarious works without hindrance. Well, now aren't we clever? What is our nefarious work, may I ask? Your password gave me a clue to the lanterns. Cry of the French revolutionists. They strung the aristocrats up on the lampposts. Then again, the combination of curious costumes and a luxurious establishment in a low-class area posed another question. What political belief provides a common meeting ground for misguided aristocrats and dangerous commoners? And how did you answer that question? Oh, very simple, my dear sir. One word. Nihilism. It's doctrine of assassination and overthrow of government would find every chance of being put into practice by all of you at the forthcoming jubilee celebrations to be held here in London. And also would account uh, for your beggar's clothes. The beggar would have greater freedom of movement in the crowd than an ordinary person. You're a clever man, Mr. Holmes. Too bad you had to die. I'll get the rope. What are you going to do with him? Do? Give him a first-hand taste of nihilism, of course. Can't live. No, too much. Well, you can't possibly do this, you know. The police will track us here. By the time the police get here, you and your friend Holmes will be blown to kingdom come. Oh, uh, Ron. Hands together, Mr. Holmes. That's it. Ah. Oh, my dear. Damn it. Risk of mine, will you? We've confounded this all. Oh, isn't that a shame now? Is this any better? Ooh. Tie up the doctor, Cecil, while I bind Holmes' legs. With pleasure. I can't go through with this. You mean, Dorothy, you can't go through with it. I just can't stand by and see two innocent men murdered. Don't be a fool, Dorothy. We can't let them live. They know too much. I don't care. If you go on with this, I'm going out for the police. Are you fool. Oh. Tie her up as well, Cecil. Leave me alone. Sit down there beside him. Go on. You're a devil, Oh, me. shut up. Now, Mr. Holmes, I'm going to fetch a little invention. A little invention I'm sure you'll be interested in. Mr. Holmes, it's a pity you and your friend didn't learn to mind your own business. I'm afraid it's too late to teach an old dog new tricks. It's too late now, at any rate. Quite comfortable, Dr. Watson? Don't you speak to me, sir. You're a filthy traitor to your country. Oh, rubbish. Here we are. Example of Mikhail Petrov's mechanical genius. Bomb will blow the entire building sky high. The three of you with it. Now, wind the time clock so. And set the fuse to go off in, in five minutes. Give us plenty of time to get away, sir. Come on, Sidney, let's get out of here. Right. <laughs> Charming picture. Three of you bound hand and foot, sitting beside each other on the sofa. <laughs> well, ta-da, Dorothy. Think of our cause during the five minutes. <laughs> As for you, Mr. Holmes, and your friend, put red and tough hands <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Well, Holmes, this looks like the end. Quite so, old chap. I blame myself. I hadn't been so infernally noisy when I recognized you. We wouldn't be in this mess. Nothing's our fault, old fellow. I think they suspected me anyway. I must say, it seemed to me that you told them a great deal more than was necessary about your suspicions. Surely you could have pretended ignorance. Oh, I suppose I could have done. I can't die yet. I'm not ready to Harry, die. Harry Brownlee, courage. And by the way, was I right in assuming that your associates are nihilists? What they are. They're planning to assassinate the Prime Minister during the Jubilee celebration. Prime Minister, great heavens, Holmes, we've got to get free. Assuming some miracle happened, and we did get free, and your former associates were arraigned in court, would you testify against them? Oh, of course I would. But what chance is there of that? That plot, that devilish plot, why doesn't it stop taking? It bothers you that much, Lady Bounty. I'll stop it for you. Holmes, your hands are free. Of course they are, my dear fellow. Bandit wrist I mentioned just now concealed a razor edged blade. I cut through the ropes almost before our friends had left the room. Then why did you keep us in this suspense, Mr. Holmes? I wanted to be quite sure that you'd testify in the forthcoming trial, madam. There we are. That renders the bomb harmless. <coughs> ah! And that means that the police have sprung the trap that I set to your associates, Lady Brownlee. It's lucky for you that you uh, had a change of heart and prevented you from leaving us. Oh, Mr. Holmes, how can I ever thank you? Oh, you had the place surrounded with police when you came in here. Of course I did, my dear fellow. Yeah, let me enter your 
your ropes. No wonder you were so calm. <laughs> no wonder you told them so much. You wanted them to show their hands. Precisely, old fellow. And they obliged me most satisfactorily. They attempted our triple murder. They are self-confessed anarchists. And with the evidence of Lady Brownlee, I'm sure that we can put them where they all belong. Considering it uh, barely noon, I think you'll agree, Watson, that is a very comprehensive morning's work. Doctor, tell the truth. Were you scared waiting for that time bomb to go off? Scared, my boy? I was so scared that to this day I can't stand being in the same room with a, a loud picking clock. Seems to speak to me. Seems to say, Tick tock, this is the end. Tick tock, this is the end. The clock ever speak to you, Roger? Yes, Doctor. How did you know? What? Tick tock with you. Tick tock. Petri took time to bring you good wine. Petri took time to bring you good oh, wine. Gracious <laughs> me. You, you listen to your clock and I'll listen to mine. Gosh, Doctor, can I help it if I like to hear about Petri wine? After all, that Petri family really knows how to make good wine. And it's no wonder. They've been making wine ever since they started the Petri business generations ago, way back in the 1800s. And because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, well, they've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, the skill and experience of each preceding generation. So naturally, when it comes to turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine, well, you just can't beat the Petri family, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And say, don't forget to take time to send for your Petri recipe calendar. It's free. Just write to Petri Wine, P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. San Francisco 26, California. This offer is intended to apply only in those states and other localities where its acceptance is permissible by law and regulation. And now, Dr. Watson, what adventure are you planning to tell us next week? Well, next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a story of old Vienna. The Vienna of sparkling lights, beautiful women, lilting music. And of an extraordinary murder that takes place to the accompaniment of a Mozart sonata. Boy, that sounds like a thriller. I'll see you for sure next week. Oh, uh, oh, just a minute. Before I go, Mr. Foreman, I want to urge every registered nurse listening in to get all the facts about the Army Nurse Corps. The Army needs you, nurses, needs you desperately. They'll make you an officer at once and give you every chance to further your post-war career. So if you're a registered nurse under 45, call at your local Red Cross chapter and get all the details. Or wire collect for the Surgeon General, U.S. Army, Washington, D.C. And if you can't qualify for the Nurses Corps, See if you can't get into essential civilian nursing so that you can release a nurse who does qualify. But do something about it first thing tomorrow, won't you? Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Five Orange Pips. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Meanwhile, don't forget to take advantage of our offer of a free recipe calendar. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, Pet, Petri wine. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes.
the Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective Sherlock Holmes. And say, I want to ask you if you sent in for that little present we've got for you. You know, that swell recipe calendar? It's free, of course, and it's really something. It's a two-year calendar for 1945 and 46, and it's beautifully done in full color. But the best part of it is that it's jammed with recipes and ideas for cooking with Petri wine. Send for your free recipe calendar tonight. Just send your name and address to Petri Wine, P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. San Francisco 26, California. The requests for this 12 calendar have been coming in so fast that you better hurry up and get yours before we get snowed under. Right tonight, and we'll send you your free recipe calendar at once. And now for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. Let's see if he's waiting for us. Good evening, Mr. Clark. Oh, good evening, Doctor. Playing the phonograph, I see. Yes, my boy. And that particular melody has some very potent memories for me. Here, I'll, I'll turn the thing off. You haven't come here to listen to the most of That's a story, don't you, young son of a lad? That's right, Doctor. Well, let's sit down. All right. That's better. Now, I'll, now I'll tell you what. Oh, thanks, Doctor. Began in Vienna in 1889, many, many years before the insane house painter named Schickelgruber had converted that gay city to a place of fear and oppression. And uh, what were you and Sherlock Holmes doing there, Doctor? Just uh, taking a trip? Mr. Foreman, in those early days of our association, we didn't have the time or the money for just uh, for taking trips. No, 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 we were in Vienna because Holmes had been engaged in certain highly important investigations. We were staying in a charming little pension inhabited by students and musicians. And on the night the story began, we'd finished dinner and had returned to our room. I was busy making some notes on the investigation we'd just concluded. And Holmes was scraping away his beloved violin. Why can't I get it? To me? Pretty, really, old chap. Ah. Mm -hmm. Another turn. Mm -hmm. A heavy fingered one at that. Listen to this. Oh. Sounds like a fiddler at an Irish wake. Oh, take it easy, Holmes. Take it easy. There's no need to fling the violin down like that. What's an old chap? Why, with all your other excellent qualities, are you not a pianist? What's a piano got to do with it? In this case, everything piano in this room, and if you could play it, not that the matter I'm struggling with might have some meaning. Come in. Oh, good evening, Fräulein. Wish to see me? You are That is my name. I am Leo Ullenstein. Live here on the continent. Oh, well, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Herr Doctor? Uh, to meet you. Mm -hmm. Fräulein Ullenstein, uh, may I pay my tribute to the brilliance of your piano playing? You have the exact precision of phrasing that Mozart demands. How do you know, Arthur? Well, Dr. Watson and I were present at the Mount performance you gave at the Imperial Court a fortnight ago. Very curious. I knew I'd seen you somewhere before. <laughs> uh, my friend was just expressing the need of a pianist as you walked in, young lady. Perhaps the, oh, I'm the two sorry. of you... I do not play with amateurs. Oh, well, really, I do not mean to be rude. It's just that my life is dedicated to my professional career. I quite understand, Paul. Mm -hmm. And now, please tell me, uh, what can I do to help you? I must presume you'll come to see me in my professional capacity. Yeah, but... That is correct, Mr. Holmes. Though I realize to a great detective like you, my problem must seem quite trivial. I... I am being blackmailed by a man in this concert. Hmm. He is Chandra Arpadi, a Hungarian painter who lives in the studio upstairs. Chandra Arpadi? Yes, I think I've heard of him. Since two months now, ever since he know my secret, he's come to me for money, and... Today he tells me he must have 250 rupees. He will go to the not that much money. Here, Holmes. Please to tell me what I shall do. Just what hold does he have over you? My brother, Carl, got into some trouble here. The police were looking for him, but he ran away to München. I was in Munich, and Sander Arpadi knew of it. He was a friend of mine, so I thought. 
When this trouble come on my blood, I turn to Shandor for help. Mother call out country, and turn on me for black. Bad manner. This is a death. Most black female are cowards at heart, and I think Dr. Watson and I will call on the gentleman. By the way, does he have any written evidence for your brother's crime? Yeah, he has his address in Munich. Show Shandor a letter from him when he first go there and keep the letter. Do not give it back to him. And if he gave the police your brother's address, they'd uh, arrest him, eh? They would, of course. <laughs> Here, Holmes, will you please to tell me what I should do? I cannot go on this way. My, my music now, is... Now, Pauline, something. calm yourself. I should be most happy to help you, and uh, if you will lead the way, we'll see how persuasive we can be with Shandola Paddy. At the end of the corridor. I see. Now remember, young lady, you'd better let me do most of the talking. Bearing in mind our father's profession, will take the liberty of opening his door. Well, look a very complicated lock to me. Oh, well, I think this skeleton key will do the trick. It's very dangerous here, Holmes. It's Chandler oh, find no, you, No, 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 don't you worry about that, Fraulein. We're perfectly capable of taking care of ourselves. Ah, uh -huh, there we are. Close the door behind you, Billy Watson. Thing. Strike a match. Oh. Got him. Look at him. Jumped over his desk. Like the gas, Billy Watson. Right you, I hope. There. Judging from his appearance, Fraulein Wollenstein, I think Sandor Paddy had other enemies besides yourself. Less scrupulous enemies. He's been strangled. With a finger mark on his throat. Is he? Yes. But it's still warm, though. I'm afraid he's dead. I am glad. That's a bad man. He deserved to be. Watson, do you notice that the fingers of the killer have broken the skin and drawn blood? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Should we not communicate with the police? Before we do that, Fraulein, we must see if we can find your brother's letter. Not to move the body, will you, Watson? Lying across an open dispatch box that might contain the document in question. Uh, Come on, Mother. That's it. Ah. Uh. Hmm. For a painter, the late Mr. Arpadi was an unusually methodical man. Everything is filed here in alphabetical order. Here we are. You, Fraulein Claire Ullenstein. The letter has a Munich postmark. I think this must be the document in question. Will you examine it, please, Fraulein? Yeah. Yeah, this is the letter. Of Holmes, how can I do it? Very little thank you for. If the blackmail of her still alive, I fear it uh, wouldn't have been so simple a matter. I wonder what other treasures this box contains. Hello. Hello. Where is it, Holmes? Interesting. 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 Look at this, old fellow. Hello. Information on the case that we've just been working on. Exactly. And from the names attached to the document, I think you may assume that the dead man did not confine his blackmailing to struggling young pianists. He was after big game, too. Yes, we'd better be careful, Holmes. I don't think that we should go for the police just yet. No. We'll start by having a little talk with the other residents of this pension. Fraulein, who lives in the room adjoining this one? I do, here, Paul. And the room across the landing? Lai Tung Fo, the great Chinese actor who's performing here in Vienna. I see. Then I think we'll start by calling on him. Return to your room, Fraulein, and we will let you know later what we've found. In the meantime, say nothing to anyone of what has happened. You do everything you tell me, Herr Holmes. And please, once again, please let me thank you for what you've done. You know, Holmes, I'm not sure if that girl didn't strangle a party herself. Janice, she would have unusual strength in her fingers. And we know that she had the, the motive. Look uh, how naturally calm she was when she realized the man was dead. I disagree with you, old fellow. Huh? I think what you refer to as unnatural calmness is really the cold detachment of the two artists. Well, I have a feeling we should keep an eye on her, just the same. We will, Watson, we will. And now I suggest we pay a visit across the landing to the distinguished Chinese actor, Mr. Ling Fu Ho. Young 
Catherine? You wish to see me? If you could spare us a moment, sir. But of course, gentlemen. Uh, please do come in. My name is Sherlock Holmes. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Uh, how, how do you do, do, sir? How do you do? I am greatly flattered to meet you. Uh, you are not here to see me in your professional capacity, I hope, Mr. Holmes. Oh, no, not exactly. I just wanted to ask you a few questions. Uh, please, do ask me any. Do you know Shandora Paddy, the painter who lives across the hall? I, uh, I uh, know him by sight. Uh, we nod to each other on the stairs. Nothing more. I see. Have you been in your room most of the evening, may I ask? Uh, yes. I have been sitting here quietly for the past few hours, reading over the Analects of Confucius. No, Confucius. Oh, uh, may I ask uh, whether you heard any unusual noises this evening? Sounds of a struggle or a cry from the direction of Sando Apardi's room, for instance? I, uh, I uh, do not think so. Wait, yes, yes. I think I did hear laced voices in there and the sound of a cry. But how long ago was this? Oh, an hour ago, perhaps more. Is uh, anything wrong? Has the trouble come to Shandor? Shandor? I thought you said you had uh, only a nodding acquaintance I with the gentleman. And he is a, a well-known artist. It is only natural I should call him by his first name, Mr. Holmes, even though I do not know him. Uh, has something happened to him? I'm afraid so, but I can't tell you any more about it at the moment. Thank you for your cooperation. We shall see you again, no doubt. Good evening, sir. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening. That fellow wasn't telling us the truth, you know, Holmes. He seemed very shifty to me. Well, where are we going now? Downstairs to the porter's desk. There's only one entrance to this house, you'll remember. The porter may be able to tell us of uh, any unusual comings and goings in the last hour or two. Come on, old chap, don't dawdle. We'll be a bit ahead of How long have you been on duty tonight? Uh, since five o'clock. Did you notice what people have come in or gone out since then? No, not for now. Ah, huh? send it. He came in. Boy, like him, son. He means just have to sit oh. and uh, the upper the painter come in a few minutes later. That is all. Ah. Who lives in the other ground floor apartments besides Dr. Watson and myself? There are only two other apartments. In the one to the right of the corridor lives uh, Madame Janssen. She's a Swedish lady, mm -hmm. a sculptor. And in the other? Signora Violetti, the Italian opera singer. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm much obliged to you. I'm happy to be of service here, Holmes. Well, where are we off to now? Back, back to our rooms? Oh, we'll call on Madame Violetti if she's at home. Oh, it sounds as if she's very much at home. That is a friend of a come to see me. Bravo, bravissimo. I have so much wish to make your acquaintance. Sit down, sit down. No, 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 I'm afraid we can only stay for a moment, madam. My, my friend wanted to ask you a few questions. Yes, signora. I just want to I know, know your question. You play the violin. I have heard you. Yes. You want to know whether the great Valeria will allow you to accompany her in the magnificent soprano aria, Allo so from Mozart's Il Flotto Magico. <laughs> the Olatti answer to your question is a uh, C. Si, si. uh, yes, madam. Uh, uh, me, Signora, but uh, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, but that was not one of my questions. It was not. But I will sting it with you just the same. You flatter me, but um, at the moment there are other things on my mind. Signora Violetti, do you know Shandora Paddy? Mm, by his side, that is all. He may cry at me, but I know pay attention. I don't even like on Gary. You haven't seen him this evening? No. I've been alone reviewing the score at La Troviata. Sempre libera di Dio, in gioia, che I am to sing it next week here in Vienna. Yes. I hope you will both be present. It would be a great treat for you. I'm sure it would be, Signora. Oh, now, you excuse us. Oh, <laughs> it is sad you must go so soon. But come and see me again, and I will sing for you both before you leave Vienna. Great Scott with a ghastly woman. She's not your murderess, I'm sure. And now I suppose we'll have to question this sculptress woman. And then we'll talk to everyone in the house. No, I think before we visit her, we'll examine the dead man's room a little more closely. That black tin dispatch box may hold the key to this mystery. Idiot. 
numbskull. I, mean, I don't think these papers thoroughly at first. Uh, they certainly tell an interesting story. A party had obviously been blackmailing Madame Janssen, the, the sculptor. Yes, and also our friend, the Chinese actor, Lai Tung Fo. Then Lai Tung Fo was lying when he said that he didn't know a party. Obviously. By George, three of the four people living in this house in his power. Hello. Uh, uh, what's the matter? What have you found? Footprints in the star ash on the carpet. Prints of a small foot. Leading us to this closet. Somebody must have been hiding in there. Yes, huh? possibly. Uh-huh. Take a look at these, Watson. And hair. Long black hair. Where were they? On a hook in the cupboard. Someone bracing themselves back so that the out of sight could easily leave such evidence. Uh, I've got it combed, I've got it. The long black hair, the long nails that caused the peculiar mark in a party's throat, and a small footprint. It was a woman. Possibly, but it's one. Fraulein Fullenstein and Signora Violetti both have blonde hair, remember? And it must be that sculptor's woman. Not necessarily. Who else, not a woman, might have small feet, long nails, and long black hair? Show me. Chinese access. Come on. with his own cue. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a second, so I'm going to take that second for a fast question. I know you've probably tasted port wine, but have you ever tasted Petri California port? Have you? Because if you haven't tried Petri port, well, you can just tell yourself right now you don't know how good a port can be. Petri port is rich, red, and hearty. But what you want to know is how does it taste? The answer to that is short and sweet. The taste is terrific. And say, Petri California Muscatel is on the terrific side, too. Petri Muscatel has the flavor and fragrance of real, juicy Muscat grape. Mm -hmm. Both wines are perfect after dinner or any time you're sitting around talking with your friends. Try them. They're great. They've got to be because they're Petri. And now, back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The famous pair are staying in Vienna, where they've become involved in the mysterious strangling of a notorious blackmailer. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are cross-questioning another of the suspects, a Swedish sculptress by the name of... What do you want with me? Why have you come in here? Well, we just wanted to ask you a few questions, madam. With my figurines, may I ask you what was working today? But what's that for you? Do you wish to buy some of my sculptures? Uh, no, but I assure you the question was pretty. Tell me who you are and stop wasting my time. Uh, my friend is a private detective, madam. A detective? Who sent you here? No one sent me here. I'm conducting an investigation of the murder of Skandor Apadi. Skandor dead? Black. Yes, madam. But we happen to know that you had a motive for killing him. He's been blackmailing you. Get out of here. What right have you to come here and question no, no, me? No, 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 no. Look here, madam. If you know what's good for you, you will answer our questions. And question. if you know what's good for you, you'll get out of here, both of you. Come along, Watson. But Holmes, you can't possibly... Forgive me, madam, for our intrusion. We meant no rudeness. You have been rude. Intolerably rude. Go away. Whatever made you back down like that, Holmes? Obviously, she's the killer. Right. But her hair, it's just black. Yes, but it's hot hair. You can notice the size of her feet anyway. She works with pay. In marble, I might have suspected her. Oh, my soul, Holmes, I wish you'd tell me what you're driving at. Uh, the answer to these killings now, Watson. Hmm? I'll have to prove it. I'm afraid I must work without you, old chap. You mind waiting for me in our room? No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. That may be dangerous. Wait for me in Senora Violetti's room, if you don't hmm? mind. I'll join you there as soon as my work is done. Pretend that you have returned because you were so enchanted with her voice. Well, Scott Holmes, you can't ask me to be alone with, with that dreadful woman. Please do as I say, Watson, and don't question me. There isn't a moment to be lost. Oh, 
know that Arya, my big dog. Senora Violetti, you can testify to it, Watson. Holmes! No, you don't, Senora. There are nails are too sharp for my liking. I'll kill you, so both of you! I'll kill you! Watson, catch her! Oh. She's painted, Holmes. Painted, eh? But an undramatic exit for a most dramatic lady. <laughs> Now that you've turned Signora Violetti over to the police, perhaps you tell me what made you certain she was the murderer. It was obvious from the beginning that Atari was strangled by someone with a long fingernail. The knife and fall with gold ruled him out. Then who was the woman with a motive and long nail? Well, no. I mention, my dear fellow, was the woman Fraulein Ullenstein? No. The concert pianist, her nails were naturally short. The sculptress who worked in clay, again, that would make it possible to mold her delicate figurine. Therefore, Signora Violetti, by the process of elimination, was the only woman with long hair. Why did she strangle the Chinese actor, too? I doubt it, you witnessed the first killing. The long black hairs in the closet were from this tube. And I presume that later, he threatened Signora Violetti, and so he himself was strangled. I still don't understand why she strangled our party in the first place. Now, you want to know, I think you'll find that uh, he's been blackmailing her, too. Remember, he had documents incriminating everyone in the house except her. I think, uh, we may assume she killed him and then removed her own papers from the dispatch box. But I had no proof, and so, well, I had to fight him up into confession. That's why you disguise yourself as I couldn't prove. Yes, I borrowed the robe and was wrong. Lucky that the light below as I entered. Yes. And it's also fortunate that to the average European, all Chinese look alike. Come in. Ah, Fraulein Ullenstein. We'll be coming in to see you in a few minutes. I so anxiously. Is everything all right? Well, from your point of view, my, my dear young lady, yes. There's nothing more for you to worry about. Oh, I would like to say you here, Holmes. I, uh, I've done that a little for you, but if you really feel that you owe me something... Yeah? Well, perhaps just this once you wouldn't mind, uh, accompanying an amateur. <laughs> it would be a pleasure. What did you wish me to play? The Mozart Sonata. But of course. There are no from the E-flat. Ah, that's splendid. Please follow you like Mozart here, Doctor? Oh, very much, young lady, very much. In fact, uh, I, uh, I might say he is my favorite composer. <laughs> charming. Perfectly charming. I only wish that, that all our adventures could end so melodiously. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Case of Identity. Mr. Rathbone appears to the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce to the courtesy of Universal Pictures where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. 
This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petrie family. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Say, and I've got a little something to tell you myself. I want to tell you that if you haven't sent in for your free recipe calendar, I think we've still got enough on hand to take care of you if you hurry. The requests have been pouring in like mad, literally by the thousands. No wonder. It's really a terrific offer. It's a calendar for 1945 and 46. It's in full color, and it tells you all you have to know about cooking with Petri wine. Write to Petri Wine, P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. San Francisco 26, California. But better hurry so we can get your recipe calendar to you immediately. <laughs> Let's drop in on our good friend, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Where are the puppies tonight? Well, I, I found them staying with a dead seagull, so they've been sent up to bed in disgrace. <laughs> you certainly look comfortable yourself, Doctor. Uh, what's that small blue book you're reading? Latest bestseller? No, 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 indeed not. This book was never a bestseller, my boy. It's entitled Practical Handbook of Bee Culture. With some observations on the segregation of bees. What a catchy title. Who's the author? Well, by the name of uh, Sherlock Holmes. He was engaged in writing it when the adventure I'm going to tell you about took place. Well, you told us last week, Doctor, that a pair of canaries played an important part in the story. That's quite right, Mr. Foreman. It was in the summer of 1908, I remember. And I'd persuaded Holmes to leave his Sussex bee farm for a few weeks and to join me in a holiday at the little fishing village of Kingsgate in Kent. We were staying at a charming little inn called the Fisherman's Arms, and for the first few days, our holiday was delightful. And then... And then, I suppose, Doctor, strange things began to happen. They did indeed, Mr. Foreman, they did indeed. Very strange things. One afternoon, we just finished the late tea, I remember, and we're sitting outside on the lawn, sunning ourselves, and enjoying our pipe. Holmes laid back, with his long, thin fingers clasped behind his head, gazing thoughtfully at the multicolored fishing boat, bobbing at anchor in the harbor. After a moment or two, he spoke. Oh, really a splendid companion. I can't think of anyone else who would let me smoke my pipe in silence for half an hour without asking you what I'm thinking about. That's not very surprising, Holmes, after all the years that we've been together. Well, nevertheless, the gift is a rare one, old chap, and I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Willow. Uh, by the way, since the half hour's up, what have you been thinking about? The lack of enterprise, a modern criminal. Audacity and romance seem to have passed forever from the criminal world. Read this note I received this morning, old fellow. See for yourself how low I have sunk. Let's have a look. Mr. Holmes, I am staying in the same inn as yourself, and as I have had a very frightening experience this week, I thought perhaps you would help me. Please do. It's signed Mary Victor. An exciting document, isn't it? Written on lavender note paper, written with virtue. The handwriting is obviously that of an adolescent girl. You haven't bothered to answer the course. Oh, yes, I have. I sent a message back by our good landlord that I was glad to hear. Why, Holmes? You came down here to complete your handbook on bee farming. Oh. Confound it. Those two wretched canaries are getting their sunbath on the windowsill above us. Oh, I think it's rather jolly to hear little fellows chirping away up there. Well, I find the sound most distracting, Mr. Inside. You know, Holmes, those birds are owned by a charming couple, a Mr. and Mrs. Wainwright. I was chatting with them on the stairs this morning. I'm afraid their charm will escape me as long as their pets continue to tweet in that irritating manner. 
spoken of the peace and quiet of the country in Watson, and yet I find that... Come in. Ah, Miss Mary Victor, I presume. Thank you, Please come in, close the door, won't you? Thank you. This is my old friend, Dr. Watson. You may speak quite freely in front of him. How do you do, Miss Victor? How do you do, Doctor? Now, sit down, young lady, and tell me what's troubling you. Mr. Holmes, I came down here from London to get away from someone, but I've been followed. I've been afraid to leave the inn, until last night I felt I couldn't stand being cooked up any longer. So I went for a walk on the seashore. Someone followed me, Mr. Holmes. I ran back here as fast as I could. But now he knows where I live. And I'm frightened. Please help me. My dear Miss Victor, I'm afraid you must be much more specific before I can help you. Who has followed you down here, and why are you afraid of it? I'll tell you the whole story. But it sounds strange to you, but I swear it. Oh, there he is again, down by the gate. I'm going to my room. Now, 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 now. No. Don't you be frightened, Miss Victor. I'm sure we'll be... Oh, my soul. What sort of thing? I don't see anyone outside who might, might have frightened her. There are two or three fishermen loitering about. Wait a minute. Here's a young fellow walking up the path. Come on, Watson. Out through the French windows again. Oh, good gracious me. Here we go again. I think we'll take the liberty of accosting him. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Are you looking for Miss Mary Victor? Is she young and pretty? Yes, sir. She is. Extremely so. Then I'm looking for her. Where can I find her? I can see you're being facetious, sir. Well, there's no harm in that, is there? By the way, who are you, gentlemen, may I ask? My name is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. I'm Basil Carter. You're not Sherlock Holmes, are you? That is my name. I thought you seemed familiar. I know your brother, Mycroft. Oh, indeed. Then I presume you're connected to the Foreign Office. Yes, I'm in the consular service. Are you staying at the inn, young man? For a few days. It's funny that I should run into the great Sherlock Holmes. Why, may I ask? I was planning a murder. <laughs> but with you gentlemen here, I see that I shall have to be very discreet. Uh, who is your intended victim, may I inquire? There are two of them. The two canaries in the room next to mine. <laughs> the moment I thought the two were really serious. But I am serious. The wretched creatures have been driving me mad. Yes, I quite sympathize with you, sir. I've been thinking of committing a slight case of mayhem on them myself. We can take one apiece, Mr. Holmes. Well, I'm glad to have met you both. I'll probably see you again. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. Good luck, Mr. Holmes. You ask me, he's the man who's been frightening the poor girl that came to us. The peculiar look on his face when you asked me if he was looking for Mary Victor. Well, there's only one person who can settle the question, and that's the young lady herself. Come on, old fellow. Let's go back indoors. Oh, shh, shh. Wainwright, the owner of the Canaries. Uh, good evening, Mr. Wainwright. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, my friend, uh, Sherlock Holmes. I am honored to meet you, sir. How do you do, Mr. Wainwright? Beautiful evening, isn't it? I just took a stroll down to the store to get some more birdseed. By the way, Mr. Holmes, I hope our canaries don't bother you. Little fellows are such a comfort to my wife and me. Oh, no, no, not at all, sir. I find that chirruping very soothing. Oh, I, I'm so glad. Good night, gentlemen. Oh, good night, sir. Good night, Mr. Wilson. Not Wilson, Mr. Holmes. Wainwright. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm so sorry. I thought you said Wilson. Good night. Not like you to mix up names, Holmes. Didn't mix them up, old fellow. I never forget a face. Mr. Wainwright is in reality Wilson, a notorious canary trainer, whom I had the pleasure of sending to prison for a seven-year stretch in 95. Some years later, he made one of the most spectacular escapes from prison in the history of crime, and has since managed to evade all efforts to recapture him. It seems to sweet old fellow. Possibly you perform, but I doubt it. Our stage is set for an intriguing problem, old chap. But our task is an interesting one. A frightened young girl, a diplomat of uncertain integrity, and a noted criminal. Watson, I have a feeling that once again the game's afoot. <laughs> Strolling along the pier instead of staying at the inn. I thought you said that you would expect some trouble. I am, old chap, and I'm sure you'll find us out. You know, Holmes, I'm still completely mystified by the behavior of that girl, Mary Victor. I knocked at her door last evening again this morning. I couldn't get any answer. The landlord told me that she did not see the dinner last night, nor at breakfast this morning. And yet her room has not been vacated. Curious. Hello, the village constable calling himself at the end of the pier. Good morning, Sergeant Blake. Hello, Dr. Watson. How are you, gentlemen? Well, splendid, thank you, sir. I've been very appreciative of the weather that you've provided for us. Oh, think nothing of it, sir. We always arrange that for our really distinguished visitors. Oh. <laughs> By the way, Mr. Holmes, I was reading one of your friend's stories about you last night. The one called 
the adventure of Mysteria Lodge. That was the uh, Wisteria Lodge, you, you foolish fellow. <laughs> well, maybe it was. Anyway, I was reading it aloud to me, old woman. And if you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Holmes, we both thought you made a bad mistake. Oh, really? Though, of course, you come out all right in the end. Yeah, because I stand reproved. Uh, excuse me, Sergeant Holmes. Holmes, look. See that figure standing by itself right at the end of the pier. Our friend Wilson, the Canary Trainer. He's got a revolver. Here, here, we don't want any of these going on in Kingston. Come on. Here, you. What are you doing waving that revolver about? Keep back, the three of you. I'm the law here. Don't you tell me what to do. Keep back, I say. I'm not afraid to fire. Better do as he says, Sergeant. You don't want to trifle with. Just exactly what are you up to, Wilson? You caught up with me once again, Sherlock Holmes. But this time you're not going to send me back to a prison again. And maybe the gallows. If I can't escape you, then I'll take my own way out with this revolver. Wilson, Wilson, what in thunder are you talking about? Murder at the inn last night. I did it. Murder? Confessing in front of the three of you, or you leave my wife alone. She didn't know anything about it. Now, I hope you're satisfied, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He's pointing the revolver as he has. Wilson, you fool, stop it. Strike me pink. He done it. Over the pier and into the sea. Get help, Sergeant. Possibly isn't dead. Right. Come on, Watson. Go back to the inn, I suppose. Possibly are. We've just heard a murder confession, but we don't know who has been murdered. Um, um, what was the telegram that you, you sent off just now? A message to my brother, Mycroft. The innkeeper informed me that Basil Carter, the young diplomat we met yesterday, left in rather hurriedly in the early hours of this morning. Come on, let's go upstairs. Well, we'll have to break the news to Mrs. Wainwright, I suppose. Before we do that, I think we'll see if Miss Victor's in her room. Which one is it? Here, upstairs. Let's take a look at it looking in. Victor hasn't been seen since last night. Uh-huh. Unlocked. Lord, what a mess. Toes strewn all over the place, open suitcases. Yeah, look at this. It looks as if the young lady had been planning an immediate departure. It seems to be. No oh, one's seen her since last night. Oh. oh, I beg your pardon, gentlemen. I thought I heard Mary Victor come in. I'm Mrs. Wainwright. Mrs. Wainwright, I'm uh, afraid we have some rather, rather bad news for you. Your husband shot himself a quarter of an hour ago at the end of the pier. His body fell into the sea. Is he dead? We must presume so, madam. I left the police sergeant there searching for him. Sergeant Blake will be back here in any moment now. Oh, you don't seem very surprised, madam. Oh, he threatened to do it. Mrs. Wainwright, before your husband shot himself, he confessed to committing a murder in this inn last night. A murder? Who is murder? At the moment, we're not quite sure. Oh, he must have been out of his mind. Mrs. Wainwright, I'm afraid I must ask you some rather painful questions. Are you aware that your husband was a criminal, that he served a prison sentence under the name of Wilson? Yes, I knew that. He told me when we were married two years ago. But he said that he'd gone straight ever since he'd come out of prison. That's why he changed his name. He was trying to make a fresh start. You know no reason for his plan to kill anyone at this inn? None. And unless you find someone murdered, I wouldn't give too much thought. Yes, you forgive my saying so, madam. You seem remarkably unmoved by your husband's tragedy. Why should I pretend? We were very unhappy together. It might be the best way out of it for both of us. My husband carried quite a large amount of life insurance. In the event of suicide, would that be payable? And on the policy, madam, then I must say that uh, from your attitude, I begin to doubt whether your husband is dead. What do you mean? I mean that if Mr. Wilson, or if you prefer it, Mr. Wainwright, wished to disappear in spectacular style, what could be simpler than to pretend to shoot himself, drop into the sea, and... I'm up here, Sergeant. Ah, did you find him? Yes, Mr. M. Fished him out right away. Dead is a doornail. Shot himself through the head, he did. Well, that disposes of your last theory, Holmes. Did you find the revolver, Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. Got it right here with me. One bullet missing. Have you found out if anyone here has been murdered, Mr. Holmes? I found out very little as yet. Wait a moment. Listen. Don't hear anything. Exactly. You hear nothing. Yet you're within a few feet of the Wainwright's room. What do you mean, Mr. Holmes? I mean that uh, there's one sound we could be hearing very clearly at the moment. I can't think of it before. 
the sound of your canaries chirruping. You've heard little else for days. Come on, Watson. Where are you going? To your room, madam. I'm afraid I must uh, dispense with asking your permission. You're already in my room. It seems a little late even to mention the subject. Give us the birthdays. The windows are open. Holy. Where's the gun? No, old chap. If you look more closely, you'll see them on the bottom of the page. Here, you can go and get one of them out. Go, Holmes. They're dead. And yet, when we entered the inn a few minutes ago, they were still chirruping. But who on earth would want to kill a couple of birds? That, my dear fellow, is one of the things we have to find out. So far, I must admit, I'm puzzled. We have a self-confessed murderer, and the nearest thing we can find to a corpse is a pair of dead canaries. <laughs> We'll bring you the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. A second I'll take, if you don't mind, to ask you if you've ever had a glass of Petri California Sherry. Because if you haven't, boy, you want to remedy that situation pronto. Try that Petri Sherry before dinner, Sonny. Look at its clear amber color. Smell the fragrance of those luscious grapes. And get a sample of that Petri flavor. Mmm, mmm. That Petri Sherry can turn the usual before dinner lull into a main event. And say, if you like your sherry dry, as I do, wait till you taste Petri Pale Dry Sherry. Is that ever good? But after all, when it's a Petri wine, it's always a good wine. And now, back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Strange events are taking place in the Kentish fishing village of Kingsgate. A self-confessed murderer has committed suicide, but his victim cannot be found. As we rejoin our story, the great detective and his old friend, Dr. Watson, are once again examining the room of Mary Victor, one of the missing girls. Oh, Holmes, the murder that Wilson confessed to before he committed suicide might have been the, the killing of those two canaries. Well, I think not, old chap. Wilson obviously loved the creatures, and kept them in spite of the fact that they were dangerously apt to identify him with his criminal past. Huh? Fast, with no, lying on the table. Yeah. Have a look. You think you can hide from me, Mary, but you can't. Wherever I go, I shall follow you. So why not get wise to yourself and stop running away? <laughs> poor girl was in danger, all right. Possibly, but the writer of that note was certainly obliging. The letter unsigned, at least this is a clue that I get it. Oh, that's true. The phrase, get wise to yourself, is very un-English. It's American. Come on, old chap. Where are we doing now? The envelope to this letter has the Kingsgate postmark on it. I'm just surprised at that fount of all knowledge. The village postmistress can't help us find an American visitor. <laughs> Hey, the young man, you must be looking for a gentleman. His name's Walter C. Bunker. And he's been in here to send telegrams. And his accent's so strong, you could cut it with a knife. It's just like one of the very Indian fellows you read about, uh, you can know. Can you tell me where he lives, uh, madam? Oh, well, then again, sir. Uh, he's been rooming at Mrs. Bell's house. Uh, 15 Laburnum Grove, uh, down behind the gas station. 15 Laburnum Grove, Mrs. Bell. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very much obliged to you. <laughs> Bell? Yes, sir. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Well, we understand that uh, Mr. Walter Bunker has been staying with you, madam. Is that right? A nice, strong American gentleman. Is he at home, may I ask? No, sir. And I'm worried about him. This morning, when he goes out, he asks me where the nearest cemetery is. Cemetery? Is it me? Huh? I tell him, and then he gets a queer kind of laugh. I'm not sure I'll see you anymore, he says. And then he walks off, and I haven't seen him since. I tell you, I'm worried about him, gentlemen. And where is the nearest cemetery, Mrs. Bell, the one you directed it to? About three miles from here. Mm -hmm. Just beside a Branson Wood. Thank you, madam. Come on, Watson. The cemetery seems deserted. Shh. Here they come to the church. Oh, Lord, it's a funeral. Or a wedding. Come on. Oh, 
By Jove, it is a wedding home. I'm afraid we're on the false trail, but we'd better make sure. Shh. Quiet, gentlemen, please. The ceremony is just ending. Just one question. Can you tell me the names of the couple who've just been married? Miss Mary Victor from the Inn, and the young American by the name of Bunker. Thank you. Yes, we have been following a false trail, confound it. The frightened young lady was merely frightened by her persistent American fiancé. Threatening letter that he sent her. Ambiguously worded, when you come to think of it. Anyway, we can cease to worry about Miss Victor. She is now Mrs. Bunker, and I think we can assume she's out of all danger. Oh, we've got to start all over again. Oh, no, no, my dear fellow. The field is narrowing. We'll head back to the inn now, and I have a feeling that we're on the last lap of our strange adventure. <laughs> Another suspect eliminated. This telegram is from my brother Mycroft. I telegraphed him earlier on today to check on the movements of uh, Basil Carter, the young man who left the scene so mysteriously in the early hours of this morning. His answer informs me that the gentleman in question was recalled to the foreign office suddenly and arrived quite safely a few hours ago. Oh, well, now I'm completely puzzled. And I, old fellow, at last see daylight. Wish I did, Mr. Allen. Sergeant, go upstairs and get the dead man's widow and bring her to my room, please. Right. And then I think I can give you the solution to this problem. What do you want with me, Mr. Holmes? Just sit down, madam. You and Sergeant Blake make yourself comfortable. Now, in the first place, the murder occurred this morning and not last night. I know what you're hinting at. The canaries. I admit I killed them. But you can't do anything to me for that. Why did you kill those birds? Everything. As much as my husband loved them. When I knew he was dead, their scene drove me mad. So I killed them. But they must have been already dead when we told you of your husband's suicide. True, Watson, but the lady was uh, fully aware that her husband was dead when we informed her of the fact. You see, uh, she murdered him. You're talking rubbish. Yes, Mr. Holmes. How could she have murdered him? We saw him shoot himself before our eyes. Because when Wilson raised that revolver to his head, he was convinced that it contained blank cartridges. Unfortunately for him, his wife had deliberately replaced the blanks with live cartridges. Oh, great heavens, why? How? Let me reconstruct the case for you. Wilson, with the connivance of his wife here, had contrived the disappearance plot. He knew that I had spotted his real identity, and so he planned this rather dramatic exit. He confessed to a non-existent murder, and then, well, had his plan materialized, he was to shoot himself with a blank. All from a pier on apparent suicide. Just his demon. How did he plan to get away? Well, he would have swum under the water, safe distance, and so made his escape. Oh, his plan couldn't have worked possibly. Oh, probably not, probably huh? not. But at least it was ingenious. He would have destroyed his true identity. And had his revenge on me by making me search for a murder that had never been committed. Unfortunately for him, his wife was his accomplice and saw in the scheme an excellent way of killing her husband. You think yourself very clever, Mr. Holmes, but even if it were true, how could you prove it? Observe this revolver, Mrs. Wilson. It's the one your husband shot himself with. What can you prove from that? Ever hear of fingerprint tests? I've heard of them. But that revolver's been underwater. True, quite true. But uh, thanks to the researches of my excellent friend, Dr. John Thorndike, an infallible test has been discovered for recording fingerprints even after immersion in seawater. I applied the test to the prints on the revolver and the bullets and compared them with some that we found on the water glass in your room. They are the same, Mrs. Wilson. Now, does a man let his wife load his suicide weapon, Sergeant Blake? I think it's obvious that the time has come for you to take over the case. All right. All right, so I did change the bullets. I hated him. I'm glad he's dead. What's why I do it again? Mr. Holmes. Yes, Sergeant Blake? Well, now that I've taken Mrs. Wilson to the station and booked her on a murder charge, I wonder if you'd mind answering a question. With pleasure. Uh, this uh, fingerprint ah. test. I'd like to know about that. Ah. I've I never heard of being able to take prints after a revolver has been handled two or three times and soaked in salt water. Yes, Holmes, and I'd like to know when you performed the test that took the prints off the glass in her room. I, I thought that I was with you all the time. Yes, yes. You were, my dear fellow. Well, then... I'll... I can give you the answer in one word. Love. What? There is no such test, my dear Watson. It would be almost impossible to expect clear prints after so much handling and totally impossible after seclusion. Fortunately for us, though, 
handkerchief won't be sellable enough to believe me and uh, give me a confession. And there's no such person as Dr. John Thorndyke? Oh, yes, yes, indeed there is. A great success last year in the case of the Red Thumbnark. Did you tell me about that case, though? No, no, I didn't. It was deliberate, old chap. With your taste for uh, writing sensational stories, I was afraid you might publish the affair. Would it be better if I had? Oh, yes, it would. What? Uh, you would have given away, uh, what shall I say, professional secrets? You would have provided the public, and in particular, the criminal public, with a complete education on fingerprints. And when that happens, my dear Watson, we shall have no tricks left. That will be a sad day for detectives. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Mr. Rathbone appears to the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor and Mr. Bruce to the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same state. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. It began on a, on, a, on a summer evening in 1906. I'd been for a long walk in the park. I remember when I returned to Baker Street and entered our rooms, Holmes looked up at me with a twinkle and... Uh, oh, positively glowing with health watch. Well, I had a splendid walk, my dear fellow. He was to come with me. The park was looking particularly beautiful. Well, old chap, during our absence, I decided to write another monograph. This Occupational liability to murder. For instance, the mortality rate is naturally high amongst instruments expected. Physicians are murdered with fair regularity, but the murder of a dentist is rare. And who ever heard of a murdered veterinary surgeon? It's quite true, but what's the occasion for this little homily? I've been browsing over my newspaper clippings. Yeah? Do you recall ever hearing of a murdered tobacconist, Watson? No, no, I can't say that I do. Oh, why? And yet my tippings inform me that no less than three tobacconists have been murdered in the past six months and all the murders have occurred in the same small shop in East End of London. Now, why do you suppose three tobacconists have been murdered in the same shop? Come now, fellow. Give me a logical solution to the problem, will you? Well, uh, let me see. You say that the shop's in the, in the East End? Yes. Is it near the river? As it happens, it's on the water's edge. Well, I'm supposing the tobacconist shop was the headquarters of a smuggling ring. Perhaps boxes of cigars were unloaded from the dock and bought from the shop. Cigars containing pearls or potions. What, sir? My dear fellow, you're doing splendidly. Oh, you must walk in the park more frequently. You're positively scintillating. Oh, no, no, you're, you're making fun of me. I show you I'm not. You're expecting anyone home? No, no, probably a visitor from Mrs. Hudson. Go on with your fascinating theory. Now, why are three tobacconists murdered? Well, because they, they know too much. Perhaps they demand a share of the profits. So the head of the ring decides to kill him. Plausible enough, Watson. I really must congratulate you. Oh. I can see that I'm very lucky in having a biographer with such a lively oh. imagination. Thanks very much. Come in. Congratulations. Oh. Oh, hello, Mr. Stan, I'm glad to see you. I'm not intruding. Not at all, my dear fellow. Come along, sit down. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Anything uh, remarkable on hand? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. Nothing very uh, particular. Ah. Then tell me all about it, Stroud. <laughs> Can't hide anything from you, can I, sir? Yes, there is something on my mind, and no mystery. And it concerns the three murdered tobacconists, I see. Now, how the blazes did you know that? Yes, Holmes, that's pure magic. 
That's all, Mary Watson. It's simple deduction. Mm -hmm. Observe the five mm -hmm. cigars peering out of Lestrade's breast mm -hmm. pocket. They are of a far superior quality to his usual brand. Obviously, the scene of his latest investigation has profited certain well, shall we say, uh, professional perquisites. Am I right, Lestrade? <laughs> well, of course you are. Careful one, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Lord. I'll stick to my pipe. Well, how about you, Doctor? Oh, thank you, Lestrade. Thank you. Corona. And now, Inspector, tell me about the murdered tobacconists. Well, how much do you know about the case? Mm, that's what I've read in the papers. Well, curiously enough, we were discussing the affair as you walked in, Lestrade. Yeah, it's a strange business, gentlemen. I only got hold of the old story today when I had a long talk to young Jack Longworth. Uh, he's the owner of the show. Well, in relation to uh, Gerald Longworth, the former member of Parliament who battled so successfully against Plum Clearance Bill? His son, Mr. Holmes. Mm. Well, nice young fellow, too. Uh, when his father died, he inherited this shop along with a lot of other property in the East End. Well, uh, how big a shop is it, Mr. Holmes? Oh, just a hole in the wall, Doctor. Like all the other shops in that part of London. The young Mr. Longworth tells me he first rents it to a man by the name of George Grinnett. He lives there with his daughter, Lily, and made a quite a nice go out of the shop. Six months ago, when Jack Longworth was abroad, George Grinnett has a stroke and nearly kicks the bucket. He, he, uh, kicks the bucket? He nearly dies, Doctor. Oh. Kicks the bucket. <laughs> I remember that. And then what happened to Stride? Well, while he's in the hospital, his daughter gives up the lease on the shop. A few days later, an Italian takes it over, and a couple of weeks later, he's found with his throat cut. Did you investigate that first murder yourself? No, Miss Holmes. Seemed like any of a dozen killings we get in that part of London. A shopkeeper cut up, his till empty, no clues. Well, who was the next tenant? A Scotch bloke by the name of Macintosh. A few weeks after he moved in, the same thing happened to him. That time, I did go down there, but I couldn't find out nothing. The robbery again, the apparent motive? Yes, sir, but the killing wasn't the same. He was strangled with a silk scarf. Silk scarf, eh? And who was the third tenant, the man who was murdered yesterday? A Hindu fellow, a man by the name of Mukherjee. He takes it over a week last Friday, and yesterday we find him nights with the back and his money gone. Of course, I was down there eh, before you could say Crystal Palace. But once again, I didn't find out nothing. No knife, no fingerprints on the till, no footprints. Just a very dead Hindu. Was young Mr. Longworth a landlord in England when these murders occurred? Yeah, that's the funny thing about it, Mr. Holmes. He docked at Tilbury yesterday morning. He didn't know nothing about what had been going on. Well, I imagine he'll have difficulty in renting the shop after three murders. Well, that's just it, Doctor. That's why he comes to me at the yard. George Grinnett, his first tenant in the shop, moved back there today with his daughter, Millie. Young Mr. Longworth's worried about them. <laughs> well, if you ask me, he's more worried about the daughter than he is about old man Grinnett. So the original tenants of the shop are back in residence again, eh? And, um, uh, what do you want me to do? Well, perhaps you'd be interested enough to come along with me and look at the shop, Mr. Holmes. I should be very glad to, my dear fellow. It's coat and hat, Watson. All right, sir. Uh, yes. Residence. I'll answer it. Hello? Mike Brown, how are you? What? Yes. Yes, he, he's here now. Of course. I'll do everything I can, certainly. Let's have dinner together soon, shall we? Splendid idea. All right, goodbye. Is that your brother home? Yes. Mr. Stroud, I do think you might have told me the whole truth. Well, how do you mean, sir? I thought your visit was prompted by a need for friendly assistance. I didn't realize came here virtually on a government order. Well, it wasn't just quite like that, Mr. Holmes. What's the government got to do with the case? And how does your brother Mycroft fit into the picture? Not eh? sure yet. But of one thing we may be certain, there's obviously a great deal more in this case than Lestrade would have us believe. Why do you say that, Holmes? You must bear in mind, old fellow, that occasionally Mycroft is the British government. <laughs> part of London take a walk in on a foggy night, ain't it, gentlemen? <laughs> All our policemen work down here in pairs, you know. Yes, I don't blame them. It's a vile neighborhood. Yes. There's the shop just ahead of us, with a sign hanging out. Hello, hello, there he is again. Oh, see that bearded in loose skulking off around the corner there? Yeah. He's been haunting the place ever since I came down here. Well, bearded man who haunts the place, eh? From yesterday, home, the Hindu proprietor of the shop was murdered. Exactly. Well, here we are. 
I'll go in first. Pressing looking place, huh? That's Lily, George Grinnett's daughter. Nope, sir. Sorry to keep you wet. Oh, it's you, Inspector Lestrade. Yes, Miss Lee. Uh, I brought some gentlemen to see your father. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watts. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. Thank you, uh, How do you do, young lady? Is your dad home? No, Inspector. He won't be in till after dinner. Went down at the docks, he did, to see about some cigar shipments. Just a long way up here. If you want to see him, we were just having some tea in the back room. Yes, uh, I'd like these gentlemen to meet him. Jack, come out in the shop, Jack. What is it, Lily? Oh, Inspector Lestrade. And this must be Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I'm sure. How do you do, sir? Hi, Mr. Longworth. I'm very glad the inspector was able to persuade you to come down here, Mr. Holmes. I'm dreadfully worried about this business, particularly since Lily's father insists on coming back here. I'm afraid they're in great danger. I can't make Mr. Grillet see it. Young lady, I wonder if I might ask you a few questions. Hey, of course, Mr. Holmes. Before your father had his stroke, did he receive any threats concerning his occupancy of the shop? Well, if he did, he never told me about him. It wouldn't surprise me. I often told him his biggest enemy is himself, if you know what I mean. Yes, I got you, Mr. Willis. When your father had his illness, who decided to give up the lease on the shop? I did. No money was coming in, and, well, it looked like Dad might be an invalid for life. Of course, I couldn't run the shop by myself. Anyhow, I never did like this part of London. It wasn't the right business for Father. Uh, what was his reaction when you told him uh, to give up the lease? He was awful angry with me. Said I'd no right to do it without asking him. Uh, by the way, yeah, we saw that bearded Hindu again as we walked up just now. Been hanging around ever since we came back here, Inspector. Well, has he actually come into the shop, Miss Phillips? No, but he keeps walking by and looking in the window. I'm sure if we both went into the back room or left the shop for a little while, he'd come right in. Then I suggest you give him the opportunity you're seeking. Miss Phillips, I wonder if you and Mr. Long would mind leaving the shop for a while. Of course not, Mr. Holmes. Make your departure rather ostentatious, though he uh, can't help noticing it. Give us half an hour or so and then come back. Perhaps you wouldn't mind going with him, Mr. Rudd. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, this is my case. I know, I know, but um, in a situation like this, Watson and I work much better alone. We may have to go a little outside the law and your presence might embarrass us. <laughs> You'd never think I was a detective too, would you? Very well, we'll be Mr. back in half an hour. <laughs> Poor old Lestrade. Get very touchy as the years roll by. Yeah, I blame him. I'm leaving him completely in the dark. Come on, Watson. Behind the counter. No, 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 no. my dear fellow. Not Please. under it. Not under it, old chap. We lift the flap. So. Ah, now it's just we crouch down behind here. Don't have a bother, Watson. Good. In the meantime, make yourself as comfortable as these cramped reporters will permit. We may have uh, quite a wait ahead of us. Look, look, Holmes. There's the Hindu now. Put your hands up. I got you covered with this revolver. Now, my man, what are you doing here? Who? Who are you? Never mind who I am. Just answer my question. I do not speak very good English. You mean to stand about foreign sector? Ah, sector high. You don't know the ayah. Take me to Asti. Tomorrow, why? Who come here? Tomorrow, why? From Johnny sector. Oh, that's a... Salah. No, 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 you don't, my man. Just you stay where you are. It's all right, Watson. Let him go. He's on our side. Wish you tell me what in Panda's going on, who that man was, and why you let him go. He's an investigator from the Foreign Office, old chap. Given his instructions by my brother, Mycroft. Mycroft? Yes, old fellow. When my brother fails to tell me all the facts concerning this case, I begin to think these triple murders have far greater ramifications than we ever dreamed of. <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a second. Just about time enough for me to mention that any meal becomes a better meal when you serve it with Petri wine. And say, you'll find that Petri California Burgundy and Petri California Sauterne are just made to go with food. 
That Petri Burgundy is a rich red wine that bosom pals with any meat or meat dish. Boy, what a flavor. And that Petri Sauterne is the delicate white wine that's just perfect with chicken or with fish. Yes, sir, with food, you just can't beat a good Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. A puzzling case is occupying the attentions of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Three murders have taken place in a small tobacconist shop in the east end of London. As we rejoin our story, it's late at night, and Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, accompanied by Inspector Lestrade, are once again walking towards the station. Well, I don't see that you've accomplished much, Mr. Holmes, except that you just bought me a nice dinner. I'm making progress, Lestrade. It's only by the elimination of obvious suspects. There's a pattern to this case. That should give us a clue. Well, how do you mean, Holmes? My dear fellow, consider the obvious motive of these murders and particularly observe the results they've obtained. Well, the motive was the same in all three killings. Robbery. Oh, no, Lestrade. Not with the theft of two pounds from the till. Blind you to the real motive. Now, look, look, look. Good evening, evening Miss Grillet. Hello, Holmes. Is your father home yet? Yes, he is, Mr. Holmes. I can't tell you how anxious I am for you to talk to him. I'm going to meet Mr. Longhair. He's taken me to the music hall. I should be home just after ten. I hope you'll be able to stay with Dad until then. Well, don't you worry, Miss Willett. We'll keep an eye on him. Oh, thanks ever so much. Oh, um... Oh, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Miss Willett? Please don't go into our rooms in the back, will you? I've left things in a frightful mess. I quite understand, Miss Willett. Well, ta-ta all. See you later. <laughs> Let's go into the shop. Who is it? Oh, oh, it's you, Inspector. Yeah, these gentlemen are uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, how do you do, sir? Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. Did you meet young Lily just now? Yes, she uh, told us she was going out to that music hall with Mr. Longworth. Yes. I'm afraid we had quite a set to about that. A uh, very strong-willed girl, Lily. Very strong-willed. Might have assumed that uh, you disapprove of your daughter's association with Mr. Longworth. Yes, of course I do. He's a top. He's got lots of money. Lily's so blind she can't see that he's up to no good. I'm pretty sure he's afraid I might find out what's really at the back of these here murders. And what is your theory, sir? Well, I'll tell you this in confidence. Got nothing to back it up now, you understand. There's been talk of widening the docks around here. That'd make property values go up. Longworth's been trying to buy up all the other shops along the waterfront here, but they wouldn't sell. If you ask me, he's had these murders done just to frighten people away so that they, he could buy cheap. Now, I'm not saying that he did the murders himself, you understand, but he planned it. And these parts, it's easy enough any night to get a throat cut for a couple of quid. Yeah. That's why I'm glad you're here, gents. You see, I... Uh, I just got another warning. Warning? What do you mean, it's a warning? Found this note slipped under that door there not three quarters of an hour ago. What does it say, Holmes? I shall call on you at 8.30 tonight. You know what's good for you. You'll be waiting for me alone. Try any funny tricks, you'll go where I sent the rest of them. That's obviously been the killer. Possibly. What's the time now? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, very past eight. I uh, was hoping you gentlemen would wait in our rooms back of the shop. You can hear what's going on in here, and if you tie in any rough stuff, you can pop in and nab him. Just what I was about to suggest myself, Mr. Brent. Use the way, will you? Oh, yes. Just step behind the counter, gents. Now, through here. Ah, here we are. Ain't exactly Buckingham Palace back here. But you can make yourselves comfortable, can't you, gents? Oh, don't you worry about us, Willet. Oh, I'd better turn up the gas. If this bloke spots a light under the door in here, he might smell a rat. There we are. Now, as soon as I see him coming in the shop, I'll knock twice on the door. Like this. And that'll give you the signal that he's here. Is that right? Right, you are, Grillet. All right, now keep your ears open, gents. I may need your help. Where are you, Holmes? Huh? I can't see a thing. Over here, Watson. You know, I've, I've got another theory why Jack Longworth might be the back of all this. You listen, Holmes? Huh? Longworth knows that Grillet doesn't approve of his having anything to do with the lad. Now, when he goes abroad, he leaves instructions to murder the tobacconist. The assassins don't know about Lillette having a stroke, of course, 
and they keep murdering the wrong fella. Well, that makes very good sense, Doctor. <laughs> what do you say, Mr. Holmes? Holmes. Holmes. Where are you? Where's my police? Yeah. No, I haven't. Just explore it. Get in there at once. Open the door. Wait, stop. Never mind that. It's a soldier's instrument. Come on, come on, help me. Come on, one more. Come on. Poor devil. He's flashed the knife. Will it? Will it? What, the killer got away? I'm going to. All this charge can save your energy. Your murderer lies there. With that. Really? Of course it is. Search his pockets, Watson. I think you'll find a bloodstained knife. Let's have a look. Good Lord, there's a razor in his pocket. It's covered with blood. You mean to say that he slashed himself? Just have the handcuffs on him, Lestrade. While he's still play-acting, he may be more difficult to handle when he realizes the game's up. Take your hands off of me! Come on, quick, come on, quick, come on, here, hey. come on. Oh, you're drunk. Uh, uh. Very neat, Lestrade. Yeah. Well... Now that I've knocked a wounded man out cold, perhaps you'll tell me what's going on, Mr. Rutherford. Yes, I'm completely in the dark, too. Oh, it's very simple, really. Willett has just staged a fake attack on himself. Fool us into believing that someone else is the murderer. Yeah, but the threatening note he received. Composed by himself for the occasion. Oh, but we heard voices. We heard the shop door open. We heard Willett talking to himself. As to the shop door, that's how he gave himself away. Well, how do you mean, Mr. Rutherford? Whenever the shop door opens, a bell that jangles. Oh. Yeah, that's right, there is. No go, Django. And we were in the back room. Critic got us in there, locked the door on us unobtrusively, and staged his little drama. Yes, but we heard the door creak open and close, Mr. Oak. The creak of this flap in the counter would sound exactly the same, my dear fellow. Now listen. Yes, but why, Holmes? How did you spot that Grillet was a man? It was obvious from the beginning that since nothing had changed about the shop except the ownership, that the attackers were directed against any tobacconist who was not Grillet himself. Of course, his daughter, Lily, obviously knew what was going on. Well, I don't see how you figure that one out, Mr. Holmes. Every remark that she made showed that although she loved her father, she knew his failings. In any case, she gave me the final clue. Oh, well, what clue is that? In very pointedly asking me not to go into the back room of the shop. And of course, she meant the reverse of what she said. I followed her advice when you were explaining your theory to Miss Well, what did you find, Mr. Holmes? Miss Grillet had obligingly left a secret door open, a door leading to a passageway that seemed uh, to go down to the waterfront. We'll examine it more thoroughly in a minute. Yes, but I still don't understand Grillet's motive, Holmes. Neither do I, old chap. No, I suspect that from uh, the interest of the foreign office in the case, this shop has been the headquarters of, a, of an espionage ring. I'm afraid the final answer to that question will have to be given by someone else. Oh, who, Holmes? By my uh, elder brother, Mycroft. Humiliating, isn't it, Watson? And what was the final answer to the question, Dr. Watson? Well, well Holmes was right as usual, Mr. Foreman. The shop had been the headquarters of a spy ring operated by Grillet. And many international criminals had been smuggled in England of foreign ships moored up the river. And did Mr. Grillet hang for his crime? No, 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 he didn't, my boy. Before the, he came to trial, he, he had another stroke and he died. Probably just as well for his daughter's sake. Oh, his daughter. <laughs> his lovely girl. Did she marry Longworth? <laughs> Indeed she did. As a matter of fact, I was out to their wedding. It was a very wonderful wedding reception. Uh -huh. You would have been there yourself, Mr. Foreman. In fact, you'd have liked it very much. They, they served it. Pretty good wine. <laughs> was it a Petri wine by any chance? Mm, well, it was so good it easily might have been. <laughs> <laughs> you mean because Petri wine is the kind of a wine you can't forget? That's exactly what I do. Well, mean. that's because the Petri family really knows all there is to know about the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. You see, the Petri family's been making wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And they've been able to hand on down in the family from father to son, from father to son, every bit of their skill and experience. That's why Petri wine is so good today, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And say, don't forget to take a moment yourself and send for your free recipe calendar. 
Remember, send to Petri Wine. Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, San Francisco 26, California. This offer is intended to apply only in those states and other localities where its acceptance is permissible by law and regulation. And now, Doctor, do you feel like giving us a hint about next week's story? Yes, I do. Next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a strange adventure that happened to Holmes and me in the West End of London. It concerns the death of a famous actor who was portraying the part of an equally famous man, Sherlock Holmes. Thank you, Doctor. See you next week. And say, from the news we've had so far today, maybe by next week at this time, we'll hear some really good news from Europe. I certainly hope so, Mr. Foreman. But let us remember the war won't be over when Germany quits. We've still got to lick Japan. That's going to take a long time. So instead of celebrating when VE Day comes along, let's just strengthen our resolve to support the war more than ever here at home. Keep that war job. Don't leave it till you're released. Keep on buying more and more and more war bonds and, and keep them. Don't turn them in. Help all you can in all home front activities and observe all our wartime regulations such as price ceiling. That's the real way to celebrate a victory in Europe, by working harder to end the war in the Pacific. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Six Napoleon. Mr. Rathbone appears with the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce with the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Meanwhile, don't forget to take advantage of our offer of a free recipe calendar. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, pet. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. I suppose your dinner is well over by now, so now's the perfect time to get out a bottle of that swell Petri California port. You know, Petri port was just made for a time like this, after dinner when you're just taking things easy. If you've ever tasted Petri port, you know what I mean. It's a hearty, full-bodied wine with a deep red color and a flavor that's just about out of this world. I think that if you had only one wine to choose and the whole world to choose from, chances are you'd pick port, Petri port. That's how good I think it is. That's saying plenty, I know, but I think Petri port will easily live up to all I say about it. Try it and see, and share it with your friends. You can serve Petri port proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now let's visit our old friend, Dr. Watson. Well, I'm up here on the patio, Mr. Foreman. Come on out and join me. Admiring the sunset, eh, Doctor? Yes, my boy. It's a particularly beautiful one. Well, where are the puppies this evening? Uh, asleep on a, a favorite tree coat of mine. It's just come back from the cleaning. <laughs> and you hadn't the heart to move them, I suppose. No, no, I hadn't. The little fellows looked so comfortable. In fact, I sometimes wonder if they... Uh, if you haven't come here to listen to a dissertation on the behavior of dogs. Well, it is getting near story time, Doctor. Yes, of course it is. Well, just let me uh, get my pipe properly lighted. Ah, that's it. 
The story I'm going to tell you tonight began in 1909. I received a telegram from my old friend telling me that he was leaving his Sussex bee farm and coming to London for a few days. I haven't seen the great man for several months, so naturally I went to Victoria Station to meet him. As the train drew to a stop, the door of a first-class carriage swung open and Sherlock Holmes, hand outstretched, jumped down onto the platform to greet me. What's my dear fellow, how are you? Oh, Holmes, my dear fellow, it's good to see you again. I've missed you. And are you well, chap? Harry Bates, sir? Yes, Porter, and get us a handsome cab, will you? Right, you are, Governor. I wish I'd got a spare room for you. Don't worry, Watson. I shall be very comfortable at the Diogenes Club. By the way, I trust you're free this evening. Yes, naturally. What are your plans? I thought we'd go to the theatre. Theatre? Oh, what play do you want to see? Well, I thought we'd go to the Savoy Theatre and see the Sherlock Holmes play. I hear it's enormously successful. Yes, I know it is, but I've avoided it. I'm told that Sir Claude Horton takes great liberties with your character, and as for the actor portraying me, my friends tell me it's just a travesty. He makes me nothing but a uh, bumbling old fool. <laughs> Therefore, a visit to the play might be a salutary experience for both of us. In any case, my trip to London is in response to an urgent telegram from Sir Paul himself. Seems to need my help rather badly. Oh, what's his trouble? <clears throat> well, he wasn't specific in his telegram. He suggested, however, that we attend tonight's performance and discuss the matter with him afterwards. I see. Well, I, I suppose if you can sit through it, I can. Of course you can, old fellow. In any case... You yourself are partly responsible for the play's existence. How do you mean, Holmes? <laughs> Those sensational stories you wrote of my modest problems, I I should have seen where they would eventually lead to. In time, no doubt, we shall uh, be portrayed on the cinematograph as well. Nonsense, Holmes. That newfangled thing's only a toy. I think not, Watson. We're on the edge of a strange new mechanical world. In fact, I begin to feel a certain concern about the rumored developments in wireless telegraphy. But enough of these predictions. Here comes our porter with a cab. We'll tell the driver to take us straight to the Savoy Theatre. Just look at that line of people at the box at the uh, box office home. Very flapping, old chap. Well, possibly, but I hope it doesn't mean that we've got to wait our turn. And... Oh, excuse me, gentlemen. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, aren't you? Yes, yes, I yes. thought I couldn't be mistaken. My name is Frank Ferris. I do, do, Mr. Ferris. I'm glad to meet you, sir. Sir Claude has a box reserved for you. He asked me to see that you are quite comfortable. Very considerate of him. Will you follow me, please? Thank you. Uh, neither of you has seen the play before, I understand. Uh, no, Mr. Ferris, we haven't. <laughs> I imagine it'll be a strange experience seeing yourselves portrayed on the stage. By the way... <laughs> I'm playing the part of an old friend of yours, Professor Moriarty. Oh, indeed. I'm <laughs> looking forward to a very entertaining evening. I presume that you escape our clutches, as usual? <laughs> yes, I do, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> and I've done it nightly now for 137 performances. Oh, a record that I'm sure Professor, uh, Professor Moriarty himself would envy. Had it not been for his memorable demise at the Wrexback uh, Hall. Ah, here we are, gentlemen. This is the box reserved for you. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go back to my dressing room. Oh, oh, I nearly forgot, Mr. Holmes. Sir Claude asked me to give you this note. Thank you. No, not at all. Well, I'll see you later. Huh. Very nice fellow for an actor. Don't be a snob, Watson. Well, what does Sir Claude note say? I'll read it to you. Dear Holmes, since I telegraphed you yesterday, there have been strange developments. In fact, I've been doing some detective work off stage as well as on. Watch the performance tonight and watch the audience too, particularly the occupant of the box opposite yours. Please come to my dressing room as soon as the last curtain has fallen. Well, he's being very mysterious and the box opposite ours is empty. No, no, no. Look, Watson, look. Someone has just entered. Confound it. The house lights are going out. The first act's beginning, Holmes. The first act, yes. Well, sit back and relax, old fellow. Let's see what they've done to us. Well, what did you think of the first act, Holmes? Huh? Oh, the first act, yes, yes. I was um, examining the occupant of the box opposite ours, an attractive young lady, alone and unusually preoccupied in her program. In fact, one might assume that she was trying to hide her face. Yes, but the play, don't you think it's ridiculous? Just imagine a crown jewel being stolen from the Tower of London. Why not? It's been attempted many times. Anyhow, you must admit that the actor who's portraying me behaves like a, like a blithering idiot. Uh -huh. And Sir Claude's interpretation of you is uh, 
pretty far-fetched. Far-fetched, but flattering, Watson. What poise, what suavity, and what a voice. I find myself thoroughly entertained. You're a strange chap, Holmes. No accounting for your taste. Look, Watson, look. The back of the box over there. Good Lord, I could have sworn a man dodged behind the curtain. I don't think the girl saw him, though. He looked like a foreigner. <laughs> I think as the young ladies alone will take the liberty of joining her. Oh, dash it, there go the lights again. Second act starting now. Sit down, Uncle Ove. We don't want to attract attention. We'll join her during the next intermission. Who are you? What do you want with me? Uh, my name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Well, how do you do, young lady? I hope you'll forgive this intrusion, but Sir Claude requested that I keep an eye on you during the play tonight. Please come in and sit down, won't you? Thank you. This is very kind of you. You must forgive my abruptness just now. But I've just been watching Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson being impersonated on the stage. It's, it's rather startling to have the real couple walk into my box. <laughs> yes, I quite understand. By the way, just before the curtain went up on the second act, I thought I noticed a man come into the back of this box and then disappear again. Were you aware of his presence? No, no, I didn't see him. But I know who it is. Been following me for weeks now. Perhaps you'd like to tell us about it, Miss... Uh... Henshaw. Alicia Henshaw. Yes, I would. As a matter of fact, that's why I'm here tonight. Sir Claude Horton's an old friend of my father's. I went to ask his advice. He did some investigating himself for a few days, and then he found himself a little out of his depth, so he decided to telegraph for you, Mr. Holmes. We were going to meet in his dressing room after the performance tonight. Splendid, and now, Miss Henshaw, what is your story? A strange one, Mr. Holmes, though I didn't realize just how strange until I first saw this play a few nights ago. You see, my story concerns the story of really. Good Play revolves around the same thing. Exactly. I might as well tell you how it all started. My brother was an officer in the British Army stationed in Egypt. Early this year, he saved the life of a very important native personage in some uprising in Cairo and was rewarded with a magnificent ruby. This jewel he sent to my uncle Timothy and me. Oh, we're the last of the Henshaws, you see. Did your brother tell you the name of this personage? He didn't know it, Mr. Holmes. Apparently, the whole affair was hushed up. I see. Please continue. Well, the trouble began shortly after Uncle Timothy and I received the ruby. A description of it was published in the papers, and a few days later, a message came to us from an Egyptian, Mohammed Ali, laying claim to the stone as one stolen from his family years ago. He sent an expert to our house who examined the ruby under a lens, Mr. Holmes, and then tapped it with a hammer. It fell to pieces. It was a fraud. Gracious me, an amazing thing. I'm sure that's not the end of the story, Miss Henshaw. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I wrote and told my brother what had happened. He became very suspicious and suggested that I investigate the credentials of the expert that examined the stone. I think I can finish the story for you. The supposed expert was a jewel thief who substituted a paste ruby for the real one, destroyed the imitation, and walked off with the treasure. It's an old trick. Of course, you haven't been able to find any trace of the supposed expert. Well, that's the funny part of it, Mr. Holmes. Uncle Timothy and I gave a description to the police, but it was a very vague one, I'm afraid. All the time, Uncle said the man reminded him of a colleague of his many years ago at the university, a professor of mathematics. He couldn't think of his name, but when we first saw the play a few nights ago, he was reminded of it. The name was Moriarty. Moriarty? But Moriarty's dead. Miss Henshaw, you say you uh, have been shadowed for some weeks. Yes, by an Egyptian. They've stolen the ruby, Mr. Holmes. Why don't they leave me alone? That, Miss Henshaw, represents a, a very fascinating problem and one that I shall be most happy to help you solve. Thank you so much, Mr. Henshaw. Oh, there go the lights again. The last act. Yes, the last act of this little play, but not, I fear, of Miss Henshaw's problem. Uh, let's meet after the act. It's, of course, the dressing room, shall we? <laughs> Well, Holmes, how did you enjoy the play? Very much, Sir Claude. May I introduce my old friend, Dr. Watson? How do you do, Sir Claude? How are you, Doctor? I see you've already made the acquaintance with Miss Hanshaw, and she, no doubt, has told you her troubles, eh? Oh, yes, Sir Claude. And Mr. Holmes has promised to help me. Splendid. Uh, tell me, Watson, how did you like the play? <coughs> Interesting, Sir Claude. Not quite accurate, Sir Claude. Well, you, you have to allow us a little dramatic license, you know. Uh, what did you think of Rodney, the man who was portraying you, Doctor? Well, since you mention it, I think the fellow needs to study diction. He, he mumbles so much, I don't understand a word he says. 
Oh, come now, old fellow. I, I think there are times when you're a little hard to understand yourself. Oh, rubbish. Sir Claude, I oh, hope you'll uh, meet the Diogenes Club and then we can go out and have some supper. Excellent idea. I'll join you there after I've taken off my mates. Oh. Splendid. I think I should be going home now, Sir Claude. I gave my address to Mr. Holmes so he knows where to get in touch with me. Very well, Miss Hanshaw, don't worry. I shall give your problem my undivided attention. I'll take you to your cab, my dear. Oh, there's no need to sit on. Nonsense, I insist. Goodbye. I'll be back tomorrow. Right, Miss Hanshaw. Good night, good night. Strange business, Holmes. Make of it all. Very little as yet, but it's a fascinating problem. Claude really seems to uh, have identified himself with the character of Sherlock Holmes. He gave me the impression that he feels quite capable of solving the case for himself. Lord hasn't left, has he? Oh, no, Mr. Fellows. He's coming back in a moment. Uh-huh. <clears throat> How'd you like to play, gentlemen? Very much. Your own performance as Moriarty was most convincing. Yes, Thank yes, you. indeed, sir. Congratulations. Congratulations. A couple of times there, I had a strange feeling that you, you really were Moriarty. Well, that's very flattering, Doctor. Oh. Hello. Well, it sounds as if there's some trouble at the stage door. Hey, excuse me. Come on, Watson. Let's follow him. Right. Hello, it's Claude. He seems upset about something. Yes. What's happened, Scott? Oh, there you are. I, I just seen Miss Hanshaw off in her cab when a foreign-looking fellow came out of a doorway and got into another cab. I heard him tell the driver to follow her. I, I tried to stop him, but he got away. Must be the same man that we saw in our box during the play. Yes, Claude, uh, we have our address. I think we'll drive there at once and see that she's arrived safely. We'll join you later at the Diogenes Club. <laughs> Well, Holmes, here we go. Off on another adventure. Yes, and one that may give us an opportunity of crossing swords with Moriarty once more. Oh, Moriarty's dead. He was killed when you and he fell over the precipice in 91. He was supposed to have been killed, just as I was, but his body was never found. It's impossible, or rather possible, that he returned to pour into the ears of Colonel Moran a story as unlikely and as true as the one I related to you on that April evening in 1894. One can never be sure of death, old chap, until one has touched the cold skin of a corpse. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. Hardly time for me to tell you about a really great Petri wine. Petri California Muscatel. Did you ever walk through a vineyard early in the morning and pick a big, juicy muscat grape right off the vine? If you've ever done that, then you know what to expect when you taste Petri Muscatel. Petri Muscatel is the color of golden sunshine with a flavor to match. Serve Petri Muscatel after dinner some evening, or serve it any time friends drop in. It's a wonderful way to express your hospitality with a wonderful wine, a Petri wine. Now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The famous pair have become involved in a strange mystery concerning a stolen ruby, a frightened girl, and an Egyptian who appears to be shadowing them. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are standing in a darkened alleyway. Egyptian. This place you have to down in a couple of hours. Uh-huh. Good evening, sir. Good evening. We are friends of Miss Hanshaw. And we're very curious to know why you've been following her. Sorry that I cannot answer your questions yet. Now, look here, my man. You're talking to Sherlock Holmes. You are a Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I'm greatly honored to meet you, sir. All my life, I have known of you. All my life, I have admired you. Then, in that case, perhaps you'll answer my questions. Uh, why have you been following Miss Hanshaw? Because it is my duty. What do you mean, your duty? Perhaps I should have said my destiny. For two generations now, the family of Arabi and have their lives to finding the stolen treasure of Asu. What on earth all that got to do with Miss Hanshaw? Huh? Treasure of Asu is a giant ruby. It was stolen many years ago from the family of Muhammad Ali. A few months ago, Miss Hanshaw received a mysterious ruby. I have found out many things. Sources of information. And I must regard you in the light of a, a rival detective in this case. I hardly call myself a detective, Mr. Holmes. My life is dedicated to only one problem. The 
Sancho now says the jewel was stolen from her. I do not believe it. That is why I watch her. If I am wrong this time, and I do not think I am wrong, then my quest must go on. Always it will go on. Permit me to wish you the best of luck, sir. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Good night, gentlemen. Good night. Good night. Why did you let him go, Holmes? Hmm? Why not? He's frightening Miss Henshaw. Not molesting her, old chap. In fact, it might be a good thing if someone is keeping an eye on her. And meanwhile, Watson, let's see if we can find a cab and get back to the Diogenes Club. I don't want to keep support waiting. <laughs> Lord Horton arrived yet? Yes, Mr. Holmes. He and another gentleman came in about five minutes ago. They went up to the library. The other gentleman has just left. I see. Thank you. This way, Watson. I'm sorry, Sir Claude. We've kept you waiting. We took a little longer, but... Sir Claude! Great heavens! What's the matter with him? Holmes! I... I... I found the arms. No, 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 sir. Don't try and stand up. You're, you're ill. What are you trying to tell me? The ruby. The ruby. Moriarty. trying to give me a message. He was muttering something about the ruby and Moriarty. Twice he said, it's in the book. Yes, there's a book still in his hand. It's a copy of the tales of Edgar Allan Poe. His thumb's marking the page. The story of the purloined letter. Thank you, Sir Claude. You delivered your message. Come on, Watson. If you want to catch a murderer and a thief, we must go back to the Savoy Theatre as quickly as we can. <laughs> Why do you suppose Sir Claude was murdered? Because he was too curious. He'd been investigating the problem of his stolen ruby and had found out something. Something he promised to tell me at supper, you remember? And so he was killed by a man who came with him to the club tonight. Fortunately, he gave me a clue by indicating Poe's story of the purloined letter. But I still don't see that how that helps you. Well, it leads us to the ruby. The premise of Poe's story is that the most obvious hiding place is the safest. Now, what uh, physical object was most prominent on the stage in tonight's play? By Jove, a, a ruby. Exactly. How better can you hide a stolen ruby than by exhibiting it night after night as a stolen ruby before the eyes of thousands? Well, you, you mean you expect to find it in the, in the property room backstage? Precisely. That and a murderer. Wait for us, cabby. Come on, Watson. You have your revolver, old chap? Yeah, yes, I do. Well, keep it handy. Our uh, visit may not be unexpected. Unlocked. That's good. Come on. Look, Holmes. Look. Doorkeeper. He's slumped over his desk. Hmm. Didn't give him chloroform. We'll take the liberty of borrowing his lantern. Oh. It's an eerie atmosphere. About a dark and empty theatre, isn't there? Okay. Now, where were the stage properties we kept, I wonder? Hold the lantern a little higher, will you, old fellow? Yeah. That's it. Aha. Uh -huh. Look over there. The large cabinet. It's marked property department. And it's unlocked. Oh, this is frighteningly easy. Let's look out for a trap. Now, let's see. Look, look. There's a ruby. Lying on that press. Put it up under the lantern, Watson. Exactly. It's as I thought. This is no place of stage property. It's a genuine ruby. Right at this lantern, it's very hard to... Down, Watson, quick! He nearly got us. Smashed our lantern. Yes, he's got an air rifle. Powerful one, too, confound it. No flash to indicate where he's firing from. Of course, he's baited his trap so neatly that he knows exactly where we are. I'm going to take a shot at him. I can't see anything, but at least to let him know we're armed. Now, move your position quickly, Watson. Oh, just missed me, Holmes. This is hopeless shooting in the dark. Yes. I've got to switch the stage lights on. Keep him occupied, old fellow, will you? I try to find the light switches. I've got him. But he can still shoot, confound it. Yes, but I found the light switch. Keep your eyes skinned, Watson. I'm turning it on. There he is, Holmes. Up in that box. Getting away. After him, Watson. You can jump over the footlights into the box. Ah! 
paid the furthest phone, Watson. I should have remembered that theatre exit doors always open from the inside. No, no, he didn't get away, Holmes. Look on the floor there. That Egyptian fella. You have wounded him too badly, old I chap. don't care if I have. He was trying to kill us. No, it's only a shoulder wound. He's fainted, infernal scoundrel. No, he's a very gallant man. Undoubtedly, he was trying to save us as you shot him just now. Holmes, what on earth are you talking about? Obviously, he's Moriarty. No, Watson. Moriarty just escaped through the door you heard clang a few moments ago. And what's this man doing here? As a fellow detective, undoubtedly, he followed us. Perhaps he preceded us. When Moriarty started shooting, this man tried to capture him and got wounded by you for his pains. Then who is Moriarty? He must be someone connected with this theater. It's obvious. Moriarty is Moriarty. What? You mean Frank Ferrers, the fellow that played the part on the stage? Again, remember Poe's story of the purloined letter. But why did you, did you recognize him? Oh, remember, I haven't seen him for 20 years, and you haven't forgotten his genius for disguise, have you? What incredible audacity. How better could Moriarty conceal himself than by announcing nightly to the theater-going public that he was Professor Moriarty? And he killed Sir Claude. Of course he did. Claude must have persuaded Moriarty to go to the club with him. Probably he hoped to expose him in front of me, but Moriarty found out that uh, Sir Claude knew too much. Yes. So he stabbed him. Rushed back here to bait his trap for us. Yes, 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 yes. But how did he know that we'd, uh, we'd walk into it? Well, he knew that if Sir Claude had guessed his secret, then I certainly would. And so he was waiting for us. Oh. Well, coming to. How are you feeling, my man? The ruby. The ruby. You find the ruby. Yes. Here it is, sir. Tell me. Is it the ruby of Muhammad Ali? No. No. It is a fine stone, but it is not the one for which I have searched all my life. And, sir, my endless quest must go on. Please, read it again. Poor devil. Fine mess I made of this case, Watson. Oh, I don't know. You've recovered the ruby? Yes, look at it, old fellow. Before I turn it over to Miss Hanshaw, look at it well. Probably its every facet stands for a bloody deed. It's a beautiful stone. And yet this lovely bauble has cost it for his life. And that devil Moriarty still goes free. But one day, Watson, and may the day come soon, I shall meet Moriarty again. When that happens, and I finally bring him to justice, then and only then, can you write Finney to the character of Sherlock Holmes. Well, Doctor, that was kind of an exciting story. Tell me, did the Egyptian recover from his bullet wound? Yes, indeed he did, and rather quickly, too, Mr. Foreman. I felt really badly about shooting him, but of course... Uh... Of course not. Uh, but you know, if I had to shoot someone accidentally, I, I wish it had been the, the actor who portrayed me on the stage. Wretched fellow mumbled all over the place. <laughs> oh, don't worry about that. After all, you did recover the ruby. Yes, and a beautiful stone it was. The color of, uh, well, uh, the color of a fine glass of port. And the light shines through it. By a fine port, I take it you're talking about a Petri port? Is there any other kind? <laughs> well, all kidding aside, Doctor, Petri Port, like all Petri wines, is good wine. And I can tell you why very simply. Petri took time to bring you good wine. You see, the Petri family has been making wine for a good many generations, since way back in the 1800s. And because the Petri business has always been family-owned, everything the family has ever learned about the art of making wine, they've been able to hand down from father to son. From father to son. That adds up to a lot of skill and a lot of experience when it comes to turning plump, juice-filled California grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. So when you want a wine for any occasion, obviously you can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Oh, uh, now let me see. Next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a most unusual adventure that occurred to Sherlock Holmes and me early in the last World War. It took place in Flanders and concerned a famous British general, uh, an actress, and a German firing squad. Boy, that sounds like a real thriller. Well, see you here next week. No, no, no. Uh, not here, Mr. Foreman, remember? Oh, of course. Next week, we're going to be at the Paramount Theater in Hollywood 
for the seventh war loan drive. That's quite right. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't invite you all to my home for one of our broadcasts, but we can get together next week at the Paramount Theater in Hollywood. You can get a free ticket for our broadcast by buying a war bond. And I sincerely hope that you will do this so that we can see you next week at this time. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Second Stain. Mr. Rathbone appears to the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce to the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Foreman saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by short wave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. From the stage of the Paramount Theater in Hollywood, Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. You know something? If right now it were possible for me to ask every one of you what you had for dinner this evening, I'll bet a good many of you would say chicken. Chicken is an all-American favorite. But boy, you just haven't tasted chicken till you've tried it together with a glass of well-chilled Petri California Sauterne. Petri Sauterne is a perfect mealtime wine, just made to go with chicken. That Petri Sauterne is a white wine, delicate in color, and mmm, mmm, what a flavor. A flavor that comes right from the heart of luscious, sun-ripened grapes. You can just taste those wonderful grapes. And I'll tell you something, that Petri Sauterne is pretty much on the terrific side when served with fish or any kind of seafood, too. That's a fact. But say, whenever you serve that Petri Sauterne, remember you can serve it promptly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. And now for our weekly doctor's appointment. Let's knock on his library door and see if... There's no point in doing that, Mr. Satry. I'm right behind you. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Watson. Don't tell me you've been stalking no, my boy, I was on the patio and I heard your footsteps, so I thought that I'd, uh, I'd come in and fetch you. Let's go back and sit out there, shall we? It's, it's a beautiful evening. That's fine with me, Doctor. Uh, here we are. Now, settle yourself down in a chair and, and light a cigarette, if you have one. I'll get on with my story. Well, last week, you told us it concerned an adventure that you and Sherlock Holmes had in Flanders during the First World War. That's right, Mr. Sapphire, you did. I thought that you and the great man had retired at that period. We had, my boy, but it was only natural that as soon as the war broke out, we both offered our services in any capacity that might help our country. Of course, and how did tonight's story begin, Doctor? It was in the winter of that first year. Things weren't going very well for the Allies. The Germans were advancing on Paris, and the picture was looking very black. It was just 24 hours before the famous Battle of the Marne began, the battle that changed the early course of the war, when Holmes told me that we had to go up to the front lines on a secret mission. We'd been in Paris for several weeks, where Holmes had just solved the case of the missing aide-de-camp. I was anxious to get back to England and my work in the war hospitals, 
But of course, this new summons was in the nature of a command. And so, late on a rainy September afternoon, Holmes and I, with the boom of gunfire in our ears, found ourselves in the front seat of a staff car, sloshing and jolting its way towards the battlefield. Am I driving too fast for you, gentlemen? No, Sergeant, not at all. No, no, you're doing a splendid job. Oh, my man, look out, considering the state of the road. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello. The gunfire is getting nearer, Holmes. Yes, old fellow. I imagine we haven't much further to go, have we, Sergeant? No, sir, we're nearly there. Did you notice the two civilians in the, in the back seat, Holmes? Yes. Handsome woman and a distinguished-looking man, several years her senior. I wonder who they are. I'll tell you. He's a Shakespearean actor of some note. Oh. Though he never achieved the fame to which he thinks he's entitled. I shouldn't be at all surprised if he feels that he's been slighted and not receiving a knighthood. But well, Holmes, that's amazing. How can you possibly deduce all that from just looking at the man as if we got into the car? Elementary, my dear fellow, I didn't deduce it. We saw him twice last year in the London Theatre, if you remember. What? His name is Maitland Morris. As for his biography, he's a friend of my brother, Mycroft's. He told me about him. Well, what do you suppose he's doing up here near the front line? His brother is General Sir Stanley Morris, who's in command of this particular front, and it would seem reasonable to presume that his brother has come up here to give a performance for the front line troops. Ah, I suppose this hut is as far as we can drive, Sergeant. I'm afraid so, sir. We're four miles from the front line now. You'll have to clear your papers here. Uh, see that ruined farmhouse there, sir? Yes, Sergeant. Is that the General's headquarters? Yes, sir. Come on, Watson. Good Lord, it's pelting with rain. Yeah, let's make a dash for it. Oh, who goes there? Friend. Give the password. St. Crispin. Pass friends and show your papers. Hmm. How did you know the password, yeah. then? I was given it before we left Paris, old chap. Oh, it's a real important thing just the button, isn't it? Yes, Captain. I'm Captain Maxwell, uh, General Morris' aide-de-camp. He asked me to escort you up his headquarters. Uh, by the way, weren't mentioned Morris and his wife in the car with you? Yes, they're just behind us. Oh, splendid. I'm afraid I'll have to ask to see your papers. Yes, of course. Here's, uh, here's my permit, Captain Maxwell. Thank you. I know you're both across, but we can't afford to take any chances when we're uh, this close to the enemy line. The, oh, yeah, yes, that's fine, Doctor. Everything's in order. All right, uh, good. Yours, please, Mr. Holmes. Here you are. Thanks. Who goes there? Friends. There's the rescue party now. Oh, good. This is quite an order, Mr. Holmes. Oh, oh, there you are, Captain Maxwell. Oh, hello, sir. Hello, Mrs. Morris. How are you, Captain Maxwell? Have you both met Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I suppose? Uh, no, we haven't, even though we drove up in the same car. Natural reserve of us Britishers, I suppose. How are you, Mr. Holmes? How do you do, sir? I know your brother Mycroft very well. Uh, how are you, Doctor? I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Morris. I saw you a couple of times in the theatre last year and enjoyed your performances very much. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, then you must know my wife, my leading lady. How do you do, gentlemen? How do you do, Mr. You. Morris? Uh, can I see your papers, Mr. Morris? Uh, just a matter of form. You oh, understand? Yes, 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 of course. Of course. Uh, Mrs. Morris, I presume you and your husband are going to give a performance tonight for the men going up the front line. Yes, Doctor. We're very flattered. They've asked us to do some Shakespearean things. Oh, yes. Yeah. Although I should have thought something a little lighter would have been more appropriate. The general, he's made some brother, you know, seems to be interested. Well, my dear, show Captain Maxwell your papers. Then we can all go along and see my brother Stanley. Very well, Maitland. Mr. Morris, I shall look forward to hearing your reading of Shakespeare's St. Crispin speech in Henry V tonight. Well, bless my soul, Holmes. How did you know I was planning to do it? Well, the setting is so perfect and the time so appropriate, I can't conceive an English actor who could resist the temptation. Oh, I... I noticed that your brother appreciated the fact in naming today's password. Yes, it's amazingly appropriate. You know, it's almost 500 years ago to the day that the Battle of Agincourt took place. Well, let's hope that the results of the forthcoming battle will be equally successful for you. Yes, indeed. Oh, by the way, Holmes, this will probably seem rather silly to you, but I'm an inveterate autograph collector, and I have my bookshelf with me. I, I wonder if you'd mind signing it. I'm very glad to, Mr. Morris. Give me a pen, will you, Watson? Uh, uh, here we are, Holmes. You'll find yourself among quite distinguished company in that book, sir. So I see. And a little patty. Crown Prince of Norway. Hello. Bill Marshall von Tauchnitz. Oh, yes. He was one of my admirers when I played in Munich before the war. I suppose now that our countries are fighting, I should tear that page out. You know, I cannot help but feel that art and the appreciation of art are independent of national hate. Quite so, sir. I myself still have a medal presented to me by the University of Leipzig for some trifling services. There you are, Mr. Morris. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Holmes. 
A notable addition to my collection. Uh, I shall be very glad to sign your book for you, Mr. Morris, if you'd like me to. Uh, that's very kind of you, Doctor. Oh, Captain Maxwell, uh, oh, oh, if our uh, permits are all in order, don't you think we should be moving along? Uh, just what I was going to suggest myself. Uh, I'll take you all straight, though, to Colonel Morris' headquarters. <laughs> General Morris, uh, may I introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? How do you do, sir? How are you, General? Uh, how do you do? I uh, know a lot about you. A uh, long way from Baker Street, isn't it? Yes, indeed, sir. Uh, where's that brother of mine? Oh, there you are, Maitland. Uh, Cynthia, uh, how nice to see you both. Oh, it's good to see you again, Stanley. Hello there, Stanley. Hmm, the men will be glad you arrived. They're looking forward to your show tonight. <laughs> We're very flattered that they want to hear us do some Shakespeare. Oh, rubbish, old boy. With you and Cynthia up there on the platform, you could read the telephone book and they'd love you. Oh, very kind. <laughs> By the way, you will find the stage very primitive, just a few trestles and a large tent and a curtain made of army blankets. And your dressing room will be even worse. Oh, don't worry <laughs> about our comfort, Stanley. As long as we cheer the boys up, that's the important thing. Yes, of course. By the way, what program do you have mapped out for us? Well, I thought we'd have two shows. Uh, the tent's not large enough to hold everybody at once. Anybody, anyway, uh, uh, we have to keep up an alert all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you can manage two uh, separate shows? Oh, of course I can, Stanley. I may look old, but I don't feel it. <laughs> you don't even look at your scoundrel. <laughs> Thank you. Perhaps we could take a look at the stage and equipment, eh? Oh, certainly. Uh, Captain Maxwell, uh, take them over to the tent and show them what the facilities are, will you? Right, sir. Would you follow me? Oh, yes, of course. See you later, Stanley. Good on, my dear. All right. I'm glad you're here, Holmes. I'm so I can speak quite freely in front of Dr. Watson. Oh, yes, with perfect freedom, sir. He's my colleague. He's an old army man himself. Really? What regiment, Dr. Watson? First Northumberland Fusilier, sir. Later attached to the Boxers in Afghanistan and, and wounded in, in the Battle of Mainline. Really? <laughs> then I'm sure I can speak freely in front of you. Holmes, uh, you know why you're up here so near the front line, don't you? I have a very shrewd suspicion, sir. Yeah, I thought you had. That's why I asked for you to be sent here. You asked for me to be sent here, General. Yes, I, I think I understand. Oh, I wish I did. Uh, you will, Doctor, in due time. In the meanwhile, gentlemen, I'll have an orderly show you to your quarter. Thank you, sir. And, uh, Holmes, uh, take a look around for me and keep your ears up. At a little distance from the German front lines, and look, there's a very puzzling silence just now. Uh, so, half an hour ago on our way up, there was, there was quite a lot of shilling. Exactly. It's unnatural and rather frightening at a time like this. You see, we're attacking at dawn. The enemy might be trying to infiltrate spies, and the whole success of this battle depends on a surprise attack. I quite understand, sir. Come on, Watson. <laughs> starts in a few minutes, you know. They're all there waiting here. Well, why are we tramping about up here in the, in the mud in the rain? I've got a pipe or two in the open air, but cheer our brains. Yes, a <coughs> pipe in the open air is one thing, but a pipe in a downpour of rain is another. And it's raining? Oh, didn't even notice it. I was listening to the silence. What do you mean? Thousands upon thousands of Germans. Armed Germans. Full of a blind fanatical hatred and desire to kill. A crouched in trenches only a mile or two from here. Surrounding us are an equal number of English boys, also armed. And with the will, if not the desire, to fight. Because they know their cause is the cause of freedom and justice. All these thousands poised, ready to pounce on each other and fight to the death. And yet, beyond that patter of rain, there isn't a, a sound to break the stillness of the September evening. <laughs> Strange world we live in, old chap. You're being unusually rhetorical, Holmes. Yes, I am, not I? Let's be a little more practical, shall we? I wonder what is wrong with the actors tonight. Actors? Why do you ask that? Well, a little while ago, I noticed Mrs. Morris in a great state of excitement, going towards the farmhouse where the general is. And she went back to her own quarters, and now she seems to be headed in our direction. Is there anything wrong, Mrs. Morris? Yes, Mason. What's wrong with the madam? She's disappeared. Disappeared? What's happened? We were detained together, making up for our performance. When an orderly came in with a message, Maitland said it was from his brother. Slipped on a raincoat and went out. Seeing me back in a few moments. I waited and waited. And after a while I got worried and I went over to the general myself. 
He said that he'd sent no message and that he hadn't seen any sign of Maitland. Good Lord, what can have happened to him? I don't know, Doctor, but I'm frightened. What shall I do, Mr. Holmes? You're a brave woman, Mrs. Morris. Brave? I don't know, Mr. Holmes. Why? Because the show must go on. I shall take your husband's place. But Holmes, something's happened to make him. He's in danger. He might make true, me... Watson, true. Huh? But a thousand men inside that tent are in mortal danger, too. Tomorrow morning, many of them may be corpses on the fields of Flanders. But tonight, they've been promised to show. Do you think that you can do it, Holmes? Oh, I think I can, with the help of Mrs. Morris. I can't do it, Mr. Holmes. You can, Mrs. Morris, and you will. If only to uphold that great tradition of the theater, that the show must go on. <laughs> the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Time I'd like to take to tell you that if you've got a butcher who has meat and you've got the points to get that meat, don't forget to bring home a bottle of Petri California Burgundy. Tell you why. That Petri Burgundy is a rich red mealtime wine that's wonderful with any meat or meat dish. That's a fact. Petri Burgundy can make a banquet out of a hamburger. And boy, Petri Burgundy and old-fashioned Irish stew are bosom companions. Just get yourself some Petri Burgundy and share it with your family. That true burgundy is the best friend a good meal ever had. And now, back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. It is just before the Battle of the Marne in the First World War, and Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are at headquarters a few miles behind the frontline trenches. A famous Shakespearean actor who was to give a performance for the troops has mysteriously disappeared, and the great detective has taken his place at the last minute. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes, alone on the improvised stage, is delivering a Shakespearean speech before a spellbound audience. This little world, this precious stone set in a silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier land. This blessed spot. This earth, this world, this England. Holmes, that shot, are you all right? Yes, old chap. Fortunately, I started to leave the stage as the shot was fired. The bullet just missed me. I heard it splinter some wood nearby. But who on earth would want to shoot you? That's what we've got to find out, though I think it more likely that the shot was intended for me. It was not intended for me, but for Maitland Morris. The man for whom I'm substituting. Well, even so, who'd want to shoot him? Oh, don't ask me so many questions, old fellow. Let's see what clues we can find. Now, the shot was fired from outside the tent from behind me. Yes, look there. See the hole in the tent there? Right. Jovius. The footlights would outline your shadow on the back of the tent. Whoever it must have, must have, must have fired at your silhouette. The question is, where did the bullet embed itself? Uh -huh. Look here, Watson. Have you got a pen knife? Here I am. This shouldn't be hard to extract. Look at this splintered tent pole. Wait a minute. Yeah. There we are. Excellent. Huh. Very interesting. Well, what's so interesting about it? Just a revolver bullet, isn't oh, no, it? No, it isn't, Watson. Huh? Well, it's far from just a revolver bullet. This bullet was fired from a German Luger pistol. A German pistol? There must have been a spy here behind our lines. That's a reasonable enough assumption. Yes, we may be sure that... No English soldier would carry such a weapon and face inspection. Come on, I want to talk to Mrs. Morris. Mrs. Morris, I want you to be very frank with me. But of course, Mr. Holmes. You know why your husband's missing, don't you? No, no, I don't. Have you found out anything? Come, come, madam. Why keep up this pretense any longer? I know that your husband is a spy, or at least a... A great sympathizer with the German cause. The general's brother a spy? Good Lord. How dare you say that? Because it's true. Foreign office have been suspicious of his sympathies for some time. His own brother knew it. That's why he asked to have me sent up here to keep an eye on him during his visit. It is true. Why should I keep up the pretense any longer? You see, Maitland was a disciple of Stuart Houston Chamberlain. Oh, who was this Stuart? Houston Chamberlain. An Englishman who married one of Richard Wagner's daughters and became a German citizen and an arch enemy of England. I tried to dissuade Maitland. I implored him to consider his British heritage, his brother's name and mine. But Maitland was a strange man. His life was one of frustration and envy. Envy of his brother, I suppose. Yes. When Stanley was knighted, it, it hurt Maitland terribly. 
He said it was typical of the English would knight a soldier, and yet leave a great artist like himself unrecognized. He said in Berlin, they really understood and rewarded the artist. Well, if the authorities knew that, it's amazing they allowed him to come so close to the front lines at a time like this. Oh, it was at the general's request. He wanted to plead with my husband to warn him that his secret was known. And now Maitland's gone over the German lines. Oh, it's terrible. Well, worse than that, it's, it's disastrous. He can give them information. This is the strength of our, our troops here. He knows the password. He might even know the hour of the attack is time to start. How did your husband expect to enter the German lines in safety, Mrs. Morris? He speaks fluent German, Mr. Holmes. I fancy the autograph book he was carrying containing the signature of Field Marshal von Tolkenitz. But in reality, he's passed through the German lines. You told the general that his brother was gone, of course. He hadn't been able to. He moved up to the front line position immediately after the first performance. Though I had warned him what I thought Maitland was planning to do. I think he intended to give his performance first, then cross the lines immediately afterwards. But something must have made him change his mind. Perhaps he suspected I'd warned the general. And how you know, when I got back to our quarters, he's gone. Well, did he leave any note, madam? Yes, he did. Here it is. Thank you. I have gone, my dear. Try and understand and forgive the chance. He wouldn't come with me, and so I'm taking what is left of my heart and hope where they belong. Among the friends that understand and appreciate me. It is something stronger than love and blood and country that makes me do this. It is something dearer to me than life itself. Oh. Yeah, you like the oh, poor dear. Oh, poor dear. The shame of it will kill poor Stanley. Mr. Holmes, will you break the news to him? I know it's cowardly of me, but I just can't tell him myself. Don't worry, Mrs. Morris. I'll tell him. Dr. Watson and I will ask Cap Captain Maxwell to escort us to the General's frontline headquarters. In the meantime, try and keep calm. We'll tell him. Wait in the dugout, Mr. Holmes. I'll tell the general that you're here. Thank you, and be sure to let him know the urgency of the matter. Yes, sir. Holmes, this is a dreadful business. Yes, it is, Watson. Though if my plans work out correctly, I think the success of tomorrow's battle may not be imperiled. What plan? Listen. You know, Holmes, a strange silence from the German line since we came here might be accounted for by the fact that they knew Maitland was making his getaway. They wouldn't want to risk wounding such a valuable spy. Quite possibly. What I still don't understand is who shot at you with a German pistol and why. You're being very dense, old fellow. Surely it's obvious that... There comes General Morris now. Poor devil. This is going to be a dreadful shot to him. Hello, Holmes. Uh, Dr. Watson. General Morris, I'm afraid that I've bad news for you. Your brother has gone over to the German lines. Maitland did go there. I should have put him under an armed guard as soon as he came here, but, but I thought I could reason with him, appeal to his sense of honor. Instead of which you tried to shoot him, sir, but uh, fortunately for me, you missed. You see, I took his place at the first point. But that shot was fired from a German pistol. True. That was when I first knew the general had fired the shot. But I still don't see how you could now. Only a high-ranking officer, not subject to inspection, could carry a non-regulation firearm. You're an old army man, you should know that. In any case, you'll observe that the general carries a luger at his waist. Great heavens, Holmes. I, I thought I was firing at Maitland. I, I have no idea that that it was you. You intended to kill your own brother, sir? Yes. And I'm sorry I failed. I'd rather see my brother dead than alive and a traitor to his country. But now he, he's safely on the German lines. Heaven knows what secrets he may be imparting. One thing we can be certain of. Huh? A chance of a surprise attack in the morning is gone. Possibly not, sir. Oh, what do you mean? You see, I took the liberty of altering your brother's credentials quite extensively. How, Holmes? I knew of his German sympathies. My cop had given me a great deal of information about him, and so I took it on myself to decide that it was unsafe to allow him so near the enemy lines with his own identification on him. Well, what did you do, Holmes? I took the liberty, sir, of stealing his autograph book, the one containing the magical signature of Field Marshal von Tocknitz. I have it in my pocket now. I think we shall find within its pages a code concealed in the various autographs, giving valuable information to the enemy. Good Lord. I also switched uh, military permits on him. I thought that in the event that he did go over to the German lines, his welcome might be less cordial if they were under the impression that they'd uh, captured Sherlock Holmes. 
To make that identification doubly sure, I also slipped in his pocket a slight souvenir of my own. Why, Joe Holmes, you mean that medal that was presented to you by the University of Leipzig? Exactly, old fellow. I no longer wish to uh, own a decoration given me by a country of barbarians, and it seemed a rather neat and effective way of returning it to them. So the Germans will think they captured Sherlock Holmes? Yes, sir, and unless I'm much mistaken, he'll receive very short strip of their hands. Yes, they hate you. There's your answer, sir. I'm sorry. Oh, don't be sorry, Holmes. It's better that way. Now his secret can die with him. Excuse me, sir. Uh, uh, yes, Nick. Well, what is it? Would it be in order for me to return to headquarters now, sir? It's very nearly time for the second performance, and I'd still been unable to trace the whereabouts of your brother. Well, my brother will not be acting tonight, I'm afraid. Holmes, I wonder if I might ask you to take his place once again. If you want me to, General. I do. Maitland had planned to do the St. Crispin speech from Henry V. Uh, he knew how much I loved him. I realize that, sir. But I was told the password up here. Well, can you remember the speech, Holmes? Oh, I think so. At any rate, I can try. Then do it for me, my dear fellow, will you? For me. I'll be very proud to do it, General. Goodbye and good luck. Thank you, Holmes. Captain Matthew, uh, take them back to headquarters, will you? Uh, the men will be waiting for the performance. <laughs> Christians shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile this day, so gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here. And hold their manhoods cheap, while any speaks that fought with us upon St. Christian's Day. <laughs> Well, Doctor, that was a bit of an exciting adventure. You <laughs> know, I, I can still remember that awful feeling I had when I heard the shot in the tent and realized someone had tried to kill Holmes. He did have a narrow escape, didn't well, he? Well, Holmes always said there was no such thing as a narrow escape. He said you either escaped or you didn't. If you did, well, why worry? And if you didn't, uh, you couldn't worry. So what? <laughs> Quite a philosophy. I'd uh, like to discuss it with you further. Uh, over uh, a bottle of wine? How else? Uh, what kind of wine? Uh, naturally. Uh... Uh, naturally. Oh, you couldn't ask for a more delicious wine than Petri. That's because the Petri family knows how to make good wine. They ought to. They've been making fine wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And because the business has always been family-owned and operated, well, they've been able to hand on from father to son, from father to son, all they've ever learned about the art of turning luscious grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. That's why no matter what type Petri wine you buy for any occasion, you can be sure it's good wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Now, Dr. Watson, how's about giving us a clue to next week's Sherlock Holmes well, adventure? Well, next week, Mr. Clutter, I'm going to tell you in a most unusual adventure in which Holmes and I are trapped in an airtight metal chamber, our only companion being a murdered scientist. It sounds like a story we don't want to miss, Doctor. See you next week. Yes. Oh, just a second, Mr. Clutter. Before we go, I, I just want to tell our listeners that tonight we're broadcasting from the stage of the Paramount Theatre here in Hollywood on behalf of the 7th Wall Owned Drive. The ticket of admission to the theatre was a war bond. I'm mentioning this to remind you, our friends, that you have an important part to play in making the seventh wall owner success. Buy more and buy bigger bonds than ever before. They're needed to pay for new super forts, new jet-propelled fighters, newer and bigger weapons to lick Japan. Remember, in spite of the magnificent achievements of our forces in the Pacific, the Japanese war has just begun. So let's go all out for the mighty seventh wall owner. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventures of the Blanched Soldier. Mr. Rathbone appears for the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station.
Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember. Pet, pet, Petri. This is Jack Slattery saying good night for the Petri family. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you... Rathman and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine. If I should listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Of course, I can't be as entertaining as Dr. Watson, but I can tell you something that's really worth knowing. Simply this. The best beginning a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is the perfect before-dinner wine. While you're waiting for dinner to be put on the table, pour yourself a glass of that clear, amber-colored Petri Sherry. Now, just sit back, sip it slowly. Take your time so you can thoroughly enjoy every single drop of that wonderful Petri flavor. And what a flavor that Sherry has. It comes right from the sun-ripened heart of wonderful California grapes. You may be a real wine expert and know all about sherry wine, but believe me, until you've tried a Petri sherry, you're really missing something, no kidding. Serve Petri sherry alone, or serve it with canopies or appetizers. And by all means, serve it proudly. You can, because the letters P-E-T-R-I spell the proudest name in the history of American wine, Petri. <laughs> He's expecting us. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, good evening, Doctor. Uh, good evening, Mr. Campbell. What time you got here? Draw up a chair and make yourself comfortable. Oh, thanks. Glad you have the old black dispatch box out again, I see. I suppose you've been going over your notes on tonight's adventure. <laughs> That's right, my boy. This may interest you. Mrs. Watson figured prominently in the story. You did? Yes, in fact, if it hadn't been for some remarkably quick thinking on her part, Holmes and I might have... Uh, I go again, telling you the end of the story before I forget it. Well, uh, how did it begin, Doctor? On a winter evening in 1887. I've been married some months, and in consequence, I haven't seen much of my old friend Sherlock Holmes. Well, you're still living at Baker Street, I suppose. Yes, my boy, but we couldn't persuade him to come around and see us. From time to time, I'd heard some vague accounts of his doings, of his summons to Odessa in the case of the Trepoff murder, and of his clearing up the singular tragedy of the Atkinson brothers. But to uh, get back to the night story. My wife and I had just finished an excellent dinner. I remember we had set ourselves down for an evening of pleasant domesticity. She was stitching away on a piece of expert petit pois, and I was at my desk balancing figures in the family account. After a few moments, my wife looked up to me. John, dear, don't look so troubled. Oh, was I looking troubled? Well, you've been scowling at that account book for ten minutes now. What's the matter, dear? Don't the figures add up correctly? Oh, yes. Not correct. In fact, they tell a very pretty story. After buying my practice of all my outstanding accounts, I find that we have nearly a hundred and fifty pounds left of the diary that Mr. Shorter has set for you. A hundred and sixty, isn't it, dear? I was doing the same sum this morning. Well, but that's a hundred and sixty. In any case, Mary dear, the point I was going to make is that we, we don't need the money just now. My practice is picking up splendidly, and I was thinking that we might do uh, quite a best and something really sounds good. Who is he talking to you, John? Dr. Wilson again. Well, uh, as it happens, I did bump into him at the hospital today. He could put us onto something very good in Peruvian silver. Uh, what do you think of the idea? Well, John, the, the fact is, I'd almost decided to make a business investment with him myself. I thought I'd surprise him. Well, uh, now, now let uh, me tell uh, you about uh, it, John. Oh. Yesterday, when you were out on your round, a most charming man called here, a Mrs. Ted Barber. He introduced himself as a friend of Mrs. Cecil Forrester. He said he was certain we'd be interested in his new company. 
and he talked so convincingly that, well, uh, I'm afraid I almost promised him I'd buy some stock in the company. <laughs> really? What, uh, what sort of company is it? Well, I didn't quite understand that part of it, but it sounded wonderful. He left a prospectus. It's in the right-hand drawer of the desk. It's uh, something to do with a wonderful new metal that's been discovered by an American chemist called Paradel or Paradise or something. Oh, let's have a look to what it says. Something formed to exploit the amazing new metal discovered by Dr. Paradise. Paradol preferred stuff. The potentialities of this new alloy are measurable. The fourth dimension has been conquered. What? I think this location is an accomplished fact. Oh, me, my dear child, this prospectus is absolute poppycock. Now, John, you mustn't be stubborn. Oh, I think at least we should investigate oh, it. The man said that if we went to the laboratories, Dr. Paradis would give us a demonstration himself. But, but Mary, dear, Mary, dear, the fourth dimension, I mean to say, obviously, fraud. That's what everyone says when a new invention comes out. And this might be an opportunity for us to make a lot of money, John. Mary, I do wish it. please me, dear? Well, I can't argue with you for very long, Mary. All right, all right. I'll take you to the laboratory in the morning, but I warn you, I'll show this Dr. Paradis up for the charlatan of the year. Dr. Paradis will be with you both in a moment. Well, thank you, my man. She's just concluding an experiment. She? Dr. Paradis is a woman, then? Oh, yes, madam, and a very brilliant one, too. Excuse me. Oh, it's the last one. The whole thing sounded like an obvious fraud, and now we get here and find that a woman doctor's at the back of it all. Just because she's a woman, it doesn't mean to say that... Uh, I'm Dr. Paradis. Oh, how do you do, madam? I'm Dr. Watson, and this is my wife, Mrs. Watson. Oh, yes. Come into the laboratory, won't you? Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Paradis. Well, we're just wasting your time. We're not really interested in this at all, you know. John, been... don't mutter. Well, Mr. Barber told me that he had called on you, Mrs. Watson, and that you were very interested in my invention. Oh, yes, I am. That's why I persuaded my husband to come down with me and see a demonstration. I'll be most happy to show you everything I can. Here's a practical example of the application of my work. This chamber you see in front of you is made completely of my new alloy. Well, what's the thing do? Great metal box, with dials and switches and things. Why is it so big? Do, do people get inside it? They can. What? Though if they do, they're liable to find themselves transported many miles from here. Come inside, won't you? Oh, what a lot of monsters. Now, John. Oh, John. I want you both to see that there is no exit from inside this chamber. No trapdoor to anything. The only exit is the door we just came to. Yes, it's just like an airtight metal room. Stuffy in here, isn't it? Now let's go outside. I'll show you how the machine operates. Albert! Uh, yes, Dr. Paradis. I'm going to demonstrate the Paradol chamber to Dr. and Mrs. Watson. Oh, very well. Uh, the usual time? Yes, please, Albert. Now, my assistant goes inside the chamber. I close this metal door on him, so. What are you going to do with him? Within a matter of seconds, he will be seven miles from here. <laughs> really, madam, you Please, can't Dr. expect Watson, us to believe... Please, Dr. Watson, you're a scientific man. <laughs> At least give me the opportunity of demonstrating my work. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now, I adjust these dials, turn on the electrical generator, and... Lord, an amazing business. Now, open the door, Dr. Watson, and look inside, please. Great Scott, he's gone. I don't believe it. Dr. Faraday, will you explain this to me? That my metal paradol is an unnatural alloy. What? It causes a dislocation in the warp of space and enables us to enter the fourth dimension. Mm -hmm. You see, time is a dimension. Any object in the past, present, or future can be described precisely in three dimensions of space and one of time. Yes, but this machine of yours... Uh... The alloy of paradol, combined with the great forces of electricity, has created a new force. This element is controlled by these dials and it is possible to move in four dimensions at once. Thus, bodies or other objects can be transported great distances away, all in the twinkling of an eye. I coined a word to describe the process. Teleportation, I call it. I'm completely confused. All my scientific training tells me this is impossible, and yet, uh, uh, give us another demonstration. Certainly. 
Perhaps you yourself would like to be teleported somewhere. Certainly not. The closest we uh, know. No, no, I, I think John would be very unhappy in the fourth dimension. He wouldn't be lost. Uh, uh, you said that any objects could be moved. How about that round shaped of plaster on the table over there? Certainly. It only contains some company circulars. I suggest you write your initials on it so that you can identify it later. Oh, well. J H W. There you are. Where do you want it dispatched to? Send it to my house. I'll give you the address. That won't be necessary. Good job. Exciting too. Oh, well, it's impossible. Come along, Mary. Let's get a cab and race back there as fast as we can. Well, yes, goodbye, yes. Good, 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 good. Now, see. John, you must admit you're just as excited as I am. Well, I I'm enormously intrigued. Let me just get my legs from the door here. Dr. Paradis is a devilishly clever woman. Even so, my intelligence tells me impossible for the package to reach here before us. Ah, here we are. Mum, just in time for lunch. Tell me, Annie, did a package arrive for us? Oh, yes, it did, Mum. I put it down the old place. Great yes. Scott! Uh, how was it delivered, Annie? Well, now, that's the funny thing about it, sir. I don't know. I went out to polish the glass on the door a few minutes ago, and there was the parcel lying on the doorstep. No one had rung the bell or anything. I didn't know how I got here. Thanks, Manny. You, you can go now. Yes. Well, John, what do you say now? There's a miracle that's been performed. I don't believe my eyes. Look, there are my initials on the package. Mary, if you don't mind, after lunch, I'll... You'll go around to Baker Street and tell Stella Combs about this. Mind, dear? Of course not, dear. Good. It'll be nice to see Holmes again anyway. <laughs> Dr. Watson, how nice to see you again. Hello, Mrs. Hudson. How are you, my dear? Oh, I'm just fine. Oh, you're looking grand, sir. Marriage agrees with you, if you don't mind my saying so. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Is uh, Mr. Holmes in? Aye, sir. And I'm very glad you're seeing him. He's no been acting like himself lately. Oh, really? Locking his door, and only unlocking it for me when I give him a, a, a passport. And he's hardly touched his food for the last three days. Tell you the truth, Dr. Watson. I'm awful worried about him. Well, well, I'll go up to him. He'll be glad to see you, I'm sure. Tell me what your middle initial stands for, and I'll let you in. It stands for Hamish. What? My dear fellow, how are you? I am fine and delighted to see you again, Holmes. Uh, incidentally, why all this rigmarole about locked doors and passwords? Well, uh, Professor Mariotti has decided that it's high time to settle his score with me. There have been several attempts on my life lately. Twice I've been attacked in the streets, and only yesterday a shot was fired at me through the uh, window you see broken there. Lord Holmes, you must be careful. I am being very careful. That's why I indulged in what you refer to as all this rigmarole, but uh, well, enough of my problems. What's on your mind? There's a sparkle in your eye and an air of excitement that tells me that you've uh, some news to impart. Well, I, I must say there is something. Of course, Miss Radio, come on, tell me about it. You hear of a new metal called Paradol and its inventor, Dr. Paradis? Oh, yes, yes, indeed I have. I received a prospectus concerning it the other day. Well, uh, what, uh, what do you think of the idea? Oh, obviously, it's rubbish designed to fool a gullible public into buying shares. Don't tell me that uh, you were taking it, oh, right? No, 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 of course not, Holmes. Naturally, as a scientific man, I knew it was rubbish. My uh, wife, however, had probably been involved in the concern. And so today, to prove to her that the whole thing was a fraud, we went down to the laboratory and met this Dr. Paradis. Oh, did you indeed? In the first place, let me tell you, this Dr. Paradis <laughs> is a woman. Oh, a woman? Uh, as you can imagine, I didn't have any difficulty in discrediting her theories. In fact, I'm afraid I, I made her seem rather stupid. <laughs> However, we did stay there long enough for her to, to give us a demonstration. <laughs> that it 
was, Holmes. When we got back to our house, the initial package was there, waiting for us. Charge is strict. Obviously, the Paradox Chamber contains an ingeniously hidden trap door through which the assistant disappeared and made of the package. The fast cab then took it to your home before you could get there. You really will, uh, yes, this, of course, that's exactly how I explained the thing to Mary. Was she impressed with the thing? Yes, she was. Uh, you know how women are. I tried to tell her the whole thing was a fraud. She's uh, very obstinate. I was hoping perhaps that you will help me expose the concern. Oh, it's necessary, old fellow. Such an obvious fraud. However, for your sake, I'll be glad to do anything I can. Well, I thought we might go down to the laboratory late tonight when everybody's there. Take a look at that paradox chamber a little more closely. Yes, that's rather a good idea. After being cooped up here for three days, it'll be a pleasure to get some night air and indulge in a little simple burglarizing. Well, shall I call for you here? No, no, wait a minute, dear fellow. It's much too dangerous. Uh, I'll, um, I'll be in a handsome cab outside your house about 11.30 tonight. How's that? Splendid. Quite like old time, isn't it, Holmes? Yes, it is, old chap, though I think that uh, this time, for Mrs. Watson's sake, I must try and keep you out of trouble. <laughs> The only concerned old bachelors like my sort of wandering street blunder. Oh, rubbish, Holmes. You talk as if Mary was a tyrant. Now, don't get angry with me, I was only being suspicious. Oh, Is this um, hmm? Dr. Faraday's laboratory? Yes. I can be seen. I don't imagine it would be very hard to break in, though. Strike a match, will you? I took the precaution of bringing this lantern. Yeah. Thanks, old fellow. Is the, is the door locked? Yes, but I think a skeleton key will do the trick. Hold this lantern for a second, will you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is a chance play so far. Come on. There's the, the paradox chamber over there. Hmm. Give me the lantern again, old cap, will you? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Quite an elaborate construction. The door's been left open. Let's go in and take a look at the inside of it. Ah, not so much, Watson. If this is the only entrance, and uh, the two of us walked in, it'd be too easy to slam the door shut on us. Well, I suppose so. You go in and I'll keep watch out here. All right. Oh, why, um, trust that in a few minutes I won't find myself lying on your doorstep. Holmes, there are times when your sense of humor is a little strange. Holmes! Holmes, you all right? What? What is it, Holmes? Body of a dead woman. You've been shot. Let me come and look. Thousand to one, it's Dr. Perdy's. Yes, yes, it is. Watson, get out of here. Don't you see that? Good Lord, someone has slammed the snow of the door shut on us. Yes, my dear fellow. We walked into the trap very neatly. I'm afraid that we're certainly in what appears to be an airtight metal chamber, and the only person who can help us to get out of it again is the corpse. <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. Time for me to remind you that good food always tastes better when served together with good wine. Did you know that Petri makes two wonderful mealtime wines? Wines especially made to go with food? Well, they do. Petri California Burgundy and Petri California Sauterne. You want a rich, hearty red wine, a wine that's great with any meat or meat dish, you just try a Petri Burgundy. And if you want a wine that's perfect with chicken or fish, Try a delicate golden-colored Petri Sauterne. Petri Burgundy if you want a red wine, Petri Sauterne if you want white. But always a Petri wine if you want a good wine. Now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. It was in the early hours of the winter's morning in 1887. The famous pair, while investigating the mysteries of the scientific laboratory in the east end of London, have been trapped in an airtight metal cabinet, their only companion being the dead body of a woman scientist. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes and his old friend Dr. Watson are listening intently as footsteps approach what appears to be their metal cabinet. Someone outside, sliding back the mental panel. Good evening, gentlemen. That voice, it's Dr. Perry's assistant. Let us out of here. Should I be more precise, Mr. Holmes, and say good morning? Hello, Moriarty. Moriarty, you scoundrel! Mr. 
if I hadn't wanted to. Dr. Watson, wish you could get over your dislike for me. For my own part, I'm genuinely sorry that my trap had to catch you, too. I'm not unhappy that you're not on my side. Such slavish admiration of you, given your friend Sherlock Holmes, must be highly gratified. There's none of mine about all that. What do you think you're up to? The dog is, my dear Watson. The whole scheme was a plan to lure me out of my safe hiding by presenting an intriguing problem, and one that victimized the wife of my old friend. You knew it would get back to my ears, didn't you, Moriarty? Yes, exactly. But why did you murder this Paradis woman? That's uh, equally obvious, my dear Watson. She had served her purpose in presenting a most convincing scientific front. As soon as the trap was baited, she was a liability. She might tell tales until she was killed. Like so many other of your accomplices, my dear Professor. Ah, uh, precisely. Now, my dear fellows, I'm afraid that I must close this panel and say goodbye. Quite sorry to have to kill you, but you're becoming dreadfully in my way. And how do you plan to kill us, my Arthur? By doing nothing more than closing this channel. Like you try to combat the sea deadly gases into the chamber, or poisonous snakes, or something equally colorful. Quite frankly, it seems so much simpler just to shut you in. Your oxygen supply won't last very long, you know. And for your benefit, Dr. Watson, I may tell you that Paradol, whatever its other shortcomings as a metal, is bulletproof. Goodbye, you meddling fool! There seems nothing for us to do but look around and ascertain our chances of escape. Holmes, I don't like this. We're in a very nasty situation. My dear Watson, sometimes you're a master of understatement. Uh-huh. Just as I thought. What have you found, Holmes? Huh? Sliding panel. Just behind the dead woman. It leads us to a passageway. A passageway that has been bricked up only within the last few hours. But long enough, I'm afraid, to make it impossible. No, there's no escape here. Hold the lantern a little higher, will you, Jack? Yeah. That's it. Well, what are we going to do now? I was just estimating the cubic capacity of this chamber. The air supply should last comfortably for at least another eight hours. I recommend a, a brief sleep to refresh us and also to conserve our oxygen supply. Sleep? Who could sleep at a time like this? I can and you can, old chap, if you discipline yourself. Well, I'll try, Holmes, but I know perfectly well I shan't close my eyes. Wake up, Watson, wake up. Oh, uh, yes, Mary dear. Oh, 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 it's you. Oh, it's Philip's in the trap. I'm afraid so, old chap. Oh, yeah. What time? Just after seven in the morning. Uh, how long did you estimate our oxygen supply would last? Probably about another hour. Well, it's just possible that some worker will come to the laboratory early and get us out. I shouldn't count too much on that if I were you. Uh, there's not. Mr. Holmes, I'm, I'm vanished. As I thought you would, Mr. Manchester. So I saved you this half of a bar of chocolate. I get my own share just before you were waiting. Well, thanks, my dear fellow. Uh, did, did you sleep to oh, home? No, I didn't. I employed my time in conducting my new examination of the chamber. I was trying to find some possible way of getting out. You failed, eh? I'm afraid so. Oh, this looks like the end, doesn't it? Well, if it is my time to die, I'm glad that we're together again. Although I blame myself entirely for, for letting you into the trap. Oh, no, 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 no. Bad is bad. But you admitted you're defeated. And there's no possible way out of this pit. I meant that there's no way out from the inside. So my plan worked. Good question to me. What on earth? The star. The star. There you are. Mary. Mary, you dear little thing. You you must have been frightened to death. Oh, dear. You must have been invisible now. Well, well, well. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have been getting themselves in trouble again, eh? Sir, this is no time for your heavy-handed badinage. There's the body of a murdered woman inside that chamber. She was killed by Professor Moriarty. Professor Moriarty? Too bad you didn't get my message sooner. Your message? Oh, bless my soul, Holmes. I wish you'd tell me how you got your message to Scotland Yard. Well, ever since these recent attacks on my life, I've had uh, my delightful band of ragamuffins, the Baker Street Irregulars, watching my house in six watches, two at a time. I gave the boys instructions to follow me. Whenever I went out, and if ever I did not reappear within three hours, they were to report to our friend Lestrade at Scotland Yard. Holmes, you're amazing. You, you, you think of everything. Just a minute, gentlemen, just a minute. I didn't get no message from any of your Baker Street irregulars. Oh, you didn't? No, sir. Though I did find a couple of the boys tied up when we came in here just but now. But if you didn't get a message from them, how did you come here so opportunely? <laughs> That's an easy one. 
because Mrs. Watts near came and fetched me. You did, Mary, but how on earth? <laughs> Go on, Mom. Huh? Tell him. Well, it's really very simple. When John came back from seeing you yesterday, Mr. Holmes, he was over elaborately casual in his references to the Peridor Chamber. So, of course, I knew at once the two of you were going to investigate the matter. I also caught him oiling his revolver after dinner. I didn't know that you slipped out last night, John. But as soon as I woke up this morning, I realized what had happened. So I went straight to Scotland Yard for Inspector Lestrade and brought him here with me. Why, Mary, you clever little thing. Isn't she a clever darling, Holmes? <laughs> Mrs. Watson, this has been a salutary experience. Uh, will you allow me to congratulate you on your deductive ability? Well, that's very nice of you, Mr. Holmes, but I really don't deserve any compliments, if you don't mind my saying so. It was elementary, my dear Mr. Holmes. Elementary. <laughs> This is Bob Campbell saying good night for the Petri family. This program comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another of his fascinating stories about his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. You know we're really happy to be back with you once again. And we're looking forward to getting together at this time every week from here on out. And I hope you won't mind if every once in a while I sort of get a word in edgewise about Petri wines. You know, and I really mean this, Petri wines are wonderful wines. For instance, right now, I wish I could give you a glass of Petri California port. You could hold that Petri port up to the light and look at its clear, deep red color. You could smell that luscious grape aroma. And best of all, you could taste that Petri port. What a flavor. That Petri port just sort of rolls around on your tongue, and oh boy, is that ever good. Try Petri port after dinner some evening, or try it when some friends drop in. You can serve it proudly, because after all, the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. And now let's look in on our good friend, Dr. Watson, and see if he's expecting. Come in, come in, Mr. Bartell. Just the man I've been expecting. How are you, Dr. Watson? It's good to see you again. Oh, thank you, my boy. It's very nice to see you again, too. I've missed our Monday night visits during the last three months. It's so dark. So would you care to join me in a glass of port? Thanks, Doctor. That'd be nice. You know, it seems to me, after our summer vacation, a toast to the great Sherlock Holmes would be in order. That's yes, an excellent idea. Here you are, young fellow, my lad. Thanks. You propose the toast, Doctor. To Sherlock Holmes. Master detective and loyal friend, whose adventures have brought considerable, you say, fame to a certain retired doctor now living in Northern California. I'll drink to that. Well, now, suppose I might as well get on with tonight's story. Which particular adventure have you selected, Doctor? One that I call the Limping Ghost. Sounds exciting. And, as usual, you find me saying, how did it begin? In Baker Street on a windy December evening at the turn of the century. A young, white-faced boy sat in front of our blazing fire. And as he told us his strange story, the flickering firelight danced weird patterns on the wall. The young man was Alexander McMorris, the seventh Earl of Loch Nair. The Earl of Loch Nair? Say, uh, didn't I read in the papers the other day that the eighth Earl of Loch Nair had been killed in an airplane accident? Quite right, my boy. Even in this day and age, the tragic history of violent death seems to dog the footsteps of the Loch Nair family. But to return to my story. On that December night in 1900, we heard the whole history of the limping ghost of Loch Nair. The first Earl had lost a foot at the Battle of Flodden Field in 1513. In spite of this terrible handicap, he fought on valiantly until he died on the battlefield from loss of blood. From then on, right until the time this story begins, the limping ghost, clad in a suit of armor, always appeared at Loch Nair Castle before and after the death of the current Earl. 
Yes, Mr. Bartell. It was a strange story that Sherlock Holmes and I listened to that night. A story of death and horror over the centuries, punctuated by the limping clank of ghostly armor. <laughs> husband, the Earl, was killed in the explosion that destroyed Lord Darnley. And that's the story of the Loch Ness, Mr. Holmes. You were instrumental in sending my great uncle to the gallows, a fate which he richly deserved, I'm told. So it seemed only natural to come here to Baker Street and consult you now that I'm in trouble. I shall be most happy to do anything I can to help you, sir. I don't remember anything about your sending the Earl of Loch Ness to the scaffold home. Well, he did, Dr. Watson. Oh, really? The servants have always sworn the ghost really did walk at midnight on the day that he was hanged. Indeed. Now, sir, I suggest that you tell us what problem brought you here. The ghost is walking again, Mr. Holmes. You know what that means. According to the legend, that the present Earl will die. Exactly. And as I'm the present Earl, <laughs> you can see why I'm rather worried. Am I to understand that you've actually seen this ghost yourself? Yes, Mr. Holmes. The night before last, Betty, or that is, Miss Nolan and I, were sitting in the dining hall in front of the fire. And we heard a strange sound up in the musician's gallery. We looked up and in the moonlight saw a ghostly figure in armor. Limping towards the staircase. Gracious me. Uh, my dear sir, you're certain that you really saw it? Moonlight can play strange tricks, you know. There wasn't any doubt about it, Doctor. We both really? saw and heard it. What did you do? I started to go towards the stairs, but as I did so, Betty screamed and then tumbled to the floor in a heap. Mm. Fainted, I suppose. Yes. While I was reviving her, the, the ghost disappeared. Who's staying with you at Loch Ness Castle at the moment? Well, there's Betty Nolan. She's the sister of James Nolan. He looks after my estate. Uh, Betty and I are engaged to be married. Oh, congratulations, sir. <laughs> yes, indeed. Anyone else staying with you? Yes, a distant cousin of mine, Jeremy K. McMorris, an American. He turned up in England a couple of months ago with his son, Walter. They're both with me at the present. A distant cousin. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Actually, they're descendants of a more than usually black sheep branch of the family. I, uh, I don't know how long the old man's going to be with us, though. If you ask me, he's a dying man. Why do you say that, sir? As far as I can gather, he's been wasting away for years. It's only a question of time before his strength fails him entirely. I uh, <clears throat> was hoping perhaps you could take a look at him, Dr. Watson. That is, uh, <clears throat> if I could persuade you and Mr. Holmes to come and stay at the castle for a few days. Well, what about it, Holmes? It's an intriguing problem, Watson. The current Earl of Loch Ness would seem to be in danger. A cousin of his is dying of an obscure disease, and the ghost of Loch Ness Castle is walking again. Yes, it's an irresistible invitation. I see no reason why we can't leave on the Scotch Express tonight. It's been quite a heavy fall of snow here in your absence, young man. Quite so, and judging from the color of the sky, there's more to come. Uh, very angry looking. Hmm. Oh, now as we round this bend, you'll be able to see the castle. Ah, yes. There you are, gentlemen. <laughs> Magnificent. Yes, it's a fine place, all right, Doctor, though it cost me a great deal in upkeep. Matter of fact, I only have one wing open. It's always been something of a problem to get servants to come and live here. See, the local villagers have a great respect for the Loch Ness ghost, you know. What servants do you have at the castle at present? A cook housekeeper, Mrs. McClintock, fine old lady who's been with me for six years now. And then there's old Tamas. He served my family for as long as I can remember. As a matter of fact, there he is now. Hello, Tamis. I'm glad to see you back, my lord, and that's a fact. Oh, thank you, Tamis. Oh, these gentlemen are Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson. Good, good day to you, gentlemen. How do you good do? day, Thomas. Good day. Uh, before I take the trap round to the stables, I may as well break the news to you. Yes, what's happened, Tamis? It's your cousin, my lord. Poor old Mr. McMorris. He's dead. What? Died early this morning. 
God rest his soul. Ted. Well, I'm very sorry that I arrived too late to be of any help. Well, thank you for telling me, Tamis. Oh, you may take the trap round now. Aye, sir. I'll bring the baggage up me. So he's dead. Well, I can't say it's unexpected, but it is a shock, nevertheless. I'm sure that it must be, particularly as you yourself told us you saw the ghost of Loch Nair the night before last. In which case... In which case, Watson, I think we may reasonably expect another visitation. Perhaps before the night is over. Shall we go in? <laughs> This is Miss Nolan, my fiancée, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and Dr. Watson. I'm very glad to meet you. How are you, Miss Nolan? And uh, this is her brother, James Nolan, the manager of my estate. How do you do, sir? How are you, Mr. Nolan? Much better for seeing you both up here. I'm sure it won't take you long to lay this ghost business by the heels. Oh, well, I trust you don't overestimate our abilities, Mr. Nolan. Alec, you've, you've heard about your cousin, of course. Oh, yes, my dear. Tamas told us as we drove up. Where is Walter? He went into the village with the doctor and... The body of his father. Oh. He should be back soon. How's he taking it? 